What's up, everybody? My name's Justin Allen. This is episode eight of The Shakedown, and tonight we got Chris Ball, my Uncle Walter, and what was your last name again? Roth. Scott Roth. Scott Roth. Um, Chris, we tracked some deer for over the years, so he's going to tell us about that. Um, I don't know if you can see all of them in the background, but at least maybe a few of them. And then Chris, uh, was that your first Scott. name? Scott. Scott. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, he's with a, a local mill, and he's going to start talking about some some feed that they've come up with and some seed mixtures, um, some food plot stuff. So how's everybody doing tonight? Doing great. Hanging in there. Doing good. Thanks, Chris, for having us here. This is a beautiful little place here. Well, we needed a man cave. Yeah. We needed places to, to hang stuff. The wife was. Everybody uh, needs a man cave with a 30-foot fireplace. <laughs> <laughs> a manor. Yeah, a manor. A manor. You got to, you know. So I think it was 2000, was it the season of 2020 was yeah. the first year that we tracked for you, right? A, a deer for your wife? Yep. On that farm. You called him first? Yeah, because I went down the list. I think, yes, I called you first, and mm -hmm. I think you had to work. And you said, hey, call my Uncle Walt. And I said, anybody, I'll take anybody right. at this point because uh, we could not find it. Well, we both came on that one. Had yeah. you ever called a dog before us? I have not. So that was the thing. It was crazy because even my big one I killed up there. I found it by sheer happenstance because I didn't even know really about dog tracking. And, and the guys were actually building this uh, at the same time in 2018. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Amish kid had a, it was a real young dog. So it didn't, uh, in hindsight though, it's actually going the right way, but we didn't think it was going that way because there was nothing there. It was wide open. Right. Well, the deer ran that way and that's where I found it dead. And then two, three days later. So that was your actual first experience with a dog you, right you remember what kind of dog it was uh i believe it was a, a german shepherd like a german shepherd yeah. do you know where you hit that deer this one i hit uh low and back so it was probably a gut shot yep it was a gut shot and i had good blood though for a long time and then it just it was spots but then it went down in the marsh i have in my bottom and you couldn't find anything down there it was it's just water everywhere too hard to track yeah so the dog went right through it though and we thought it would stay in the bottom, and it went up on the hill, and the and the Amish kid pulled it off. It's like, nah, no, nah, it didn't go up there. Come on, let's go. So we and so we just uh, went we through just all gave up on that, and then you ended up finding it yourself. Yeah, I found it like three days later because my buddies are like, listen, just walk around, you'll smell it, and they were right. Yeah, <laughs> I smelled it. It's uh, it's, knocked me down, especially if you hit them back like that. It doesn't oh, take yeah. very long for that. Nah. And luckily, I was still able to use the cape and everything. It was just the back end was. What well, was bad, so it, mm. uh, it was nice. But that got me into the world of dogs. So then when well, my wife hit one, I was like, all right, now i got to get somebody. And I uh, think about it on Facebook. Yeah, one probably. Of sites had and everybody's name listed. And, and when he told me, I'll come Uncle Walt, then I saw your name was listed. I was like, okay, we'll see how this goes. And, hey, for what I forget what y'all were even charging to come. And I'm like, hey, let's just try it and see what happens. Yeah. And uh, it was. Yeah, it was. I mean, it was. It was. Great. It was a. That was kind of a strange track because it took us a little while to get on the trail of that deer. I don't yeah. know. Like, you guys have been tracking it, I think. Yeah, well, remember, it, it kept circling a route. Mm -hmm. So it was blood on top of blood. Kind of overlapping his track. Yeah, it never left that block of woods where we were at. Yeah. That's what was. It was just that making was big crazy. circles yeah. in that little block. Yeah. And it was still alive. Yes. Yeah, it was still uh, alive. So, so we scent, you know, just holding in all that thick. Yeah. And there was just a lot of scent right in there. So I, I called Walter because we actually walked up on it first, and uh, I said I just jumped it. I think it took off across the field, and Walter's like, "Well, shoot, right there it is, running across the field." <laughs> so it was go. right behind that billboard sign. <laughs> yeah, luckily it went down there and expired. So I mean, it was it was pretty cool though that like we'd have never found it where it was at. I mean, it yeah. was one of them things again where there was so much blood, and you're like, I don't know where it went. We, yeah, it, we had no idea where it went because it was. You didn't think it would stay in there after you walked around it two or three times, and then you guys came out, and I'm like, "There's so much blood." But like, there was a lot of honeysuckle, a lot of ground cover. Yeah, it was really thick. I say I don't really remember what the what the land around it was like, but I don't this know, just kind of landlocked. Yeah. yeah, it was. Well, you had the highway on the one on side. The one so side. I knew it wasn't going to go that way. Big field, and then the other side was all field, and then the other side was town where there's gas stations and car washes and everything so it wasn't going to go that way there's nothing there 
So that's why I couldn't figure out where it went because I knew it lived there. It was just hiding. Yeah, we knew it was there because she killed one the year before there. So we knew they both. You could have been pushing there. it around. It may have, and that's all we were doing. We were just pushing it in a big circle. Yeah. And the crazy part was it stayed on the same path. Yeah. <laughs> Did she shoot that the same day when we came, or was that the evening before? She shot it the evening before, and then you guys. It was about twenty four hours. Yeah. By the time we got out there. Well, you got out there, but like I said, you, you guys had both the dogs. You had yep. your little dog and you, Jack Russell and all that. Jeremy Shepherd. Yeah. And then the next year, you called me for another one. Yes, that was out the other property. I and uh, you went one direction, and your yeah. buddy was with yeah. wanted to go with me and the dog. <laughs> We ended up jumping that deer twice. Yeah. Um, it, what happened to that deer? You know, I, that year I, I found out afterwards I was shooting the mechanical rages, the ones that had that didn't have the collar. Yeah. Well, we found out that when you shot those, they were not opening up. So I was basically shooting it with a field gun. Huh. Because even I shot a doe with it, and you think rage? Heck, I, the other ones we put a freaking hole in it, no hole, and there was nothing. So we, so I stopped using those, and then I saw a couple articles where people said the same thing because you shoot them with. And what crazy part was is you were it was made by rage, but it was too fast, or I was just too close. You know, I'm shooting these deer at 20, 25 yards, right? So that you know, with but, the raven, yeah, with the raven, and I got the the one that's four hundred and seventy five or whatever. You know, I don't have the four; I got the medium one, not the new new one, but the five ten. Yeah, I mean, it's still rolling out of there. So. Yeah. So, so what do you what broadhead do you shoot now? I still shoot the rage, but I do the two inch hypodermic with the with the collar. Yeah, because that's what we kill with with all of them. And even this year, when I called you guys for uh, my son that's sitting over there off camera. Uh, he killed the goofy one. I don't know if you see it over there, but that deer was cornering towards us some, and it saw us. So I told him, I said, it's either now or never, dude. So make the shot. Make the shot. And, uh, you know, luckily I was able to videotape it, and we saw stuff hanging out of it. But, you know, and when I called you, you told me, oh, you know, it's done. It's done. Yeah. it's done. And it really was, like we talked about, it was 200 yards, 300 yards up here on top of the hill. It was dead. So it – uh I never believed it, and it's hard to do it, Walt, to gut shot a deer. <laughs> it is. It's a It's a mental block. Like, it people is. don't think about it. But if you hit them there, especially with that rage, they're, 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 they're done. They're done. They just cannot survive it. And I think about that when I shoot. So I aim mid-deer, and there we go. My one I killed this one, this big one this year, I shot him with that one now at, at uh, 60 yards. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, it's getting dark, aim center mass. Yeah, and if he drops, great. If he goes for, I'm hitting him either way. That's way, and uh, that's the best target on that deer. Yeah, and he didn't move anywhere. He went down just a little bit, and he made it about ten yards. <laughs> Damn quick, <laughs> folded up like none other. He was done. He so, shot it with the raven. Shot it with the raven again. Most people, you think sixty yards, but when you're in a field in a blind, you know you can. I feel confident reaching out there, and we shoot that. You know, we we practice that. Sure. Uh, so even even I'm confident with, with my son, who's only 12, shooting out to at least 50 yards with it because those things are so so dangerous that, I mean, you're splitting arrows. At 50 yards, they shoot, is, shoot really good, which yeah. Is, which is crazy nowadays. I wish I could go back to my compound, but yeah. with kids and uh, age, sports and everything. <laughs> I know I can still get it back. I, can still pull it back. I, just, I ain't that old yet. I'm not that crippled though. Yep. I feel like it, but uh, now the bigger problem is I just don't have time. Yeah. So then I don't feel confident in, and even ethical taking a shot at that That's to right. where you know. I mean, oh, to be honest, dear. like you know, to be honest, I feel bad calling you guys, you know, because then to me I didn't make a good shot. Like I wasn't prepared enough. But the thing I love about calling you guys is we always find. Oh sure. yeah. Yeah, a live or you know, no. Yeah, you, you've never not found a deer when I've called. How many have we tracked now? Uh, what is that, three? I think three. So we tracked the one together, yep. and then I tracked one without Walter, yep. and then Walter tracked Tracker. one without me. Yep. What was the one that you guys tracked? Well, that I was. That's we were talking about. He's uh, the first time that you did come up and track that one for the second. I tracked you two up. without you. Yeah. The one was a long track that was, we never found. It was a live one. Yeah, that one, that one stayed, that was the mechanical, that was the other mechanical, I shot two deer with that broadhead and didn't kill them. Did that, that deer ever show back up? It never did, so I imagine it died, 
<laughs> or the neighbor got it. Yeah, but I sold the property too, so. Yeah, it was going. I don't know, I don't know either. I, I sold the no, property. Yeah. I was like, heck with it. We trapped in a long ways. But yeah, I, 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 I was telling Scott about uh, the first time I had you guys come out and you, you brought the Jack, Ru uh, Jack Russell out and you put goggles on it and I'm like, He's got Ray Charles. <laughs> like, are you kidding me? This dog is Ray Charles. Well, he had actually cut his eye. He had just oh, scratched oh, his oh. eye, and he didn't want to track. You yeah. know, he just he could didn't want to go any further. So I seen those goggles on the internet. Yeah, and uh, I got him those goggles. He'd wear them. Oh, yeah. he'd, he'd take right off wearing. He, I mean, he was the cutest thing. I mean, watching the track with them goggles, I'm like, this is awesome. Yeah. Nobody's gonna believe me. Yeah. I've got to take a picture of this. You guys are not gonna believe this. Yeah, he still got those goggles. Yeah, but I, I, we don't need them. You know, that's the thing, too, is, you know, I know you guys have tracked for a couple of my buddies, too. The guy that mm -hmm. taxidermy, um, you know, I know you tracked, too, for him. And it's been nice to then. You guys are, we can count on you. That sure. thing. I know if I can call you, I can count on you guys to come and you make an effort to get here. Or even this year, uh, you know, Walt, I set you the video of his. And you're like, listen, don't bother. I'm not even going to bother coming. You're going to find it. Yeah, you'll get it. Let it go overnight. We let it go. Next morning, we found it. So well, it helps a lot when you got a video. Wow, I I recommend that. It's a lot easier when you uh, when someone else is shooting to video. <laughs> or so that always makes a. Sure. I couldn't videotape mine because I was like, did I make a good shot? I don't know. Now I'm paranoid because it was right. It was going back towards my neighbors. I'm like, oh, don't go over there. But, so, so how many years you been like real serious about hunting whitetails? So that's crazy. I, when I started, I started when I was my son's age, probably 10, 11. My dad would, uh, he would take me out. But you remember back then, that was the mid 80s, late, or probably say early 90s. You went three days, four if you were lucky. You got to hunt Monday, Tuesday of gun season, Saturday. And if you're lucky, Saturday. Thanksgiving. Yeah, that was it. So we, we never bow hunted. I never bow hunted a day uh, until I was like 16 years old. And that's when I killed actually my first deer was I was 16. I shot some doe, but my first buck was literally 16 years old. I shot at my neighbor's, uh, my parents' house, my neighbor's yard. I thought he was going to be mad at me. I come, <laughs> my neighbor, I come I come back from hunting because there were some woods at the top of the road I lived on, and I come back down, and he was a hard guy. So he's a hard guy to read. You know, oh, and he saw me walking down the road, and I'm like, oh, man, he's going to be pissed. He was like, I got bucks in my backyard rubbing my trees. Why don't you get down there and shoot one? So I did. Nice. <laughs> That's awesome. Nice. I did. And uh, yeah, so after that, man, I was, I was, I was just hooked. But you know, it got harder as you know, land started to grab up. You know, no one wants to let you go. And then, then it was like, I don't want to knock on doors all the time. I don't want to ride around and look for deer. I know guys that do that. Um, you know, go. I just I went into that, and one property here. I'm at the end of the hollow, so I don't get that many deer that travel in. So the ground that I had, my 20 acres that I have up top here, you know, it was full of just locust trees and everything. So I'd probably say eight years ago, I told my wife, I said, I'm going I'm to bulldoze it all. So I got a skid steer, I popped them all out, and I put my first food plot at it. And then I got, I know, the local... Um, I think a lot of the places have the soil and water departments. You can get the uh, corn planter. Right. Oh, you can rent it yeah. or whatever. Yeah. Problem was I didn't have a tractor. <laughs> so I had to get a tractor. So luckily my neighbor let me borrow his tractor just to pull it around, you know, plant it. And, uh, you know, and I know a lot of guys out there, you know, women get on you about the stuff, but my wife likes to hunt too. So she was always nagging me. Oh, it's always time it we got to do something all the time. You know, May, you got to plant stuff. Then you got to, you know. and I'm like, listen, if you don't do it. So the very next year, uh, something happened and I, I couldn't get this tractor and I didn't plant enough. So we had zero deer. Made a big deal. Made a big deal. And she was like, okay, I'll leave you alone. Because <laughs> I get it. I, if you don't do stuff in the summertime and spring, you don't get anything for late. So I just started messing around you know, myself with buying the commercial stuff online and, and that gets real expensive real fast, but it was working. Um, corn, you know, baiting, you know, it works, but everybody has a corn pile. Sure. So I figured, okay, what else can I do to try something different? So I bought the cheap soybean planter from Rural Cape, which was at the time when they were selling it, it was 800 bucks. Now I think it's 1800, but you know, I rigged it up to where it works better. I built a bigger box. 
it's been a game changer. I noticed bigger deer, I noticed bigger racks, and then I noticed a lot more deer live on me now because now they have the food from, they'll eat the soybean early and then they'll go to a law where they don't eat it because then they come back late season because and eat the beans. After it cracks. Yeah, because they don't they don't touch it until everything else is gone, which was weird to me because I'm like, they're never going to eat these the first year. I'm like, what the heck? And then I came back like six, seven days later, they were all gone. Yeah. <laughs> so I was like, well, they're eating it. And then I start reading about deer with protein. You start watching the guys online, Lee and Tiffany, uh, you know, Kiskis, all those people, they start talking about deer management, herd management. I'm like, you know, whatever. But then once you start looking at it, and you do it for two or three years, and you start to see bigger bucks. So those 140s now were 150s. Okay, well, again, I never killed a deer over 140 till, hell, I was in my 30s, mid-30s, just because I didn't know what I was doing. You know, it was all trial and error. You didn't, I didn't have a place to hunt until I bought my farm here, and then Luckily. Chopped the first bucket, walked in. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I did. Listen, I'm not, I'm not going to kid you. That buck's not here uh, because the mount was horrendous. Uh, the lady that mounted it was horrendous. So I got the antlers. Those are my lucky right on antlers. But I literally shot it right outside here. I was right on the corner over here. Uh, first day, I'll never forget. First day, I bought it on Friday. And gun season started Monday. I bought this farm on Friday. And I got in that tree on Monday morning, 7.30, he come walking across. I dropped my glove. I looked up, and there he was. And that was the biggest deer I killed in my life till that point. And, and how big do you think it was? I think he was mid-150s. And, I mean, I was tickled to death. I mean, first of all, oh, yeah. yeah, I mean, I'm shaking, and then I watched the deer stand back up. You got to be shitting me. I'm shooting a muzzleloader. <laughs> <laughs> Saw him up. <laughs> back and I, then it fell back over. It's like, thank God. Because there's no way I would have shot it again because I was, and, and again, that was before I really trail cameras were hit either. Like, you know, you could take them and get the pictures. Right. There was no Eight dollars roll. Yeah, I mean, so I didn't have a clue what was here. I mean, I bought it, just the coal company was selling it, and, and I beat them up long enough to, to let them sell it to me. And so it worked out. But then, like I said, year after year now, I was like, I'm not getting any big deer. Like, what's going on? I'm letting them go. They don't get any bigger. Like, what's going on? So I started. Decided to grow. Yep. I figured mm -hmm. I had to do something to grow. So we started doing, I uh, started feeding, and then I'm looking into, you know, planting all the stuff. And then the last couple of years, that's where I've gotten uh, hooked up with Scott. Uh, so we've become pretty good friends here. And uh, I'll let you tell what you do, and then we can go into that. Yeah, so... Uh from a, a hunting standpoint, you guys are way more experienced than I ever or ever will be. Um, but I've found all my deer on my own, except for the one that I missed. <laughs> so I, I actually called Chris earlier uh, this hunting season, and uh, you know he he came over. I was like, man, I think I shot a big one, and uh, didn't find any blood, didn't find anything, and yeah, we were actually talking about calling the dog tracker and, and mm -hmm. things like that because I. I could have swore I hit it, you know, um, but it was a miss. Uh, a buddy of mine ended up shooting the deer a couple of days later. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, man, sickening. <laughs> but for him, right? yeah, yeah. Yeah. You're happy for him. Yeah, so uh, I started hunting five years ago or so, hanging out with some buddies one night after work, drinking a couple of beers, and they're like, it was, it was right before muzzle loader season. And they're, they're talking me into coming hunting with them the next day. I was like, I've never been hunting, you know, I was like, I've shot guns, different things like that, but never shooting at a deer or anything. So they talked me into getting my license. I hop online, fill out my license, and uh, the next day about 10 of us go out. Um, and, like, the goal for the day was to get me a deer. Like, all these guys, experienced hunters, all that stuff, doing some uh, sure. doing some drives. Yeah. And they, I end up shooting a little eight-point buck, and uh, I've been pretty hooked ever since, you know. So, got the bug. Yeah. Yeah, buck fever. <laughs> That's it. That's it. Well, then when you got friends like, like this guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That, this alone will give you buck fever. <laughs> well, the the big one I get all the time is is, and I always tell everybody, I'm I'm the best best guide in Belmont County because two or three of these deer are mine. The rest are my wife and my kids. Which my oldest son is going to turn twelve here. And my youngest is ten. So 
they get to shoot a lot of bucks and I get a lot of grief from the other dads like seriously dude <laughs> seriously like why can't I shoot a deer like Lex or why can't I shoot a deer like me well you go out there and you ask Chris why <laughs> that's right so I, I I don't feel bad but I do on some of this stuff because like I said uh Lex at four years old killed his first or five killed his first buck four killed his first doe so I took me uh you know 14 more years to to get into where he was at. Yeah, I was in my thirties before I killed the yeah. first Pope and Young Buck. Yeah. So me and Chris meet, our boys play ball together. Um, I work at the local feed mill, Belmont Mills. Um, and at this time I'm getting into hunting as well. So start to have some interest in all these things myself. Um, and you know, come over here to work baseball and I look at Chris's wall and I'm like, what do you, how do you do this? You know? Um, and he starts telling me ab about what he does and, and, you know, managing the herd. Um, and, and that led us into putting some custom rations together, um, minerals, getting the extra, you know, just feeding corn. Yeah. You're getting protein. It's an attractant. Um, but really getting into the minerals and looking at the herd health, um, treating it more of a, uh, a, a true herd or, or like a cattle herd, you know right. what I mean? Um, being a feed mill, that's, that's what we do. Um, grow and, and develop animals, right? Like everything from the health of the, the doe, the fawns, like if, if the proper minerals, um, are in the animal, they, they're, they're going to produce healthier offspring, right? Reach your full potential. Y yes. So, um, we got into that, uh, Chris has a, a custom mix that we do. Um, it's really not rocket science. I mean, you can look at like a like a pure like mineral mix that you come up with. So it's he has corn mixed in with it, and then the mineral as well. Um, we put uh, a good bit of molasses on it, so it has a, a sweet smell to it um, for the attractant, and it also allows. It, so then your mineral sticks to your corn um, and flows through the gravity feeder well. You know, if you just put loose mineral in a gravity feeder, moisture, different things happen, it's not going to flow flow very well. So we've uh, kind of concocted this whole thing, a little trial and error on it. Um, and, and, you know, Chris has, has done it kind of at a supersized level, so to speak. Um, you know, he he bought a, uh, a bunk to put six ton of mater material in. You know, I, I don't know too many guys that, that are willing to do that, which – but then you look at his wall and it, it kind of makes sense. You know? Oh yeah. Or, um, so it, it's been, uh, it's been good for us. We're, we're learning. He's helping us learn. So it's, it's cool. Yeah. It's back and forth a little bit. Of well, and that's where you, you get online and you look at these different products and I, and I looked everywhere when I was like, well, how do I get them protein in the winter? You know, I feed corn all winter cause I want to keep them here and you know, everything else they'll eat down, they'll eat all my corn cause I've got my skid steer, I've got a brush cutter on the front. So usually Thursday or Wednesday before gun season, I'll cut that. And this year we were up there and my wife was still after hers. We had 48 deer on literally 10, 12 acres of corn. So you planted a, all, deer. all corn and then you just brush hogged it down. I just brush hogged it down. I, I wait till then because I've known, you know, over the last, you know, 10 years I've been messing with this okay, what do I need to do? So I just take that brush cutter and it literally just mm -hmm. mulches it up. So it's good because then you'll see a whole cobs and then there'll be stuff under it. So then they'll dig at it till where we're at now, you know, it's all gone. So I still was like, okay, so I still got to get them something to, you know, get that growth. Like what can I still do that? Well, there's not much in corn that's really no. beneficial to them. But. Well, and then you look at too that, you know, they say a deer can only handle 18% protein. The rest of it is just literally out the back end. So a lot of those mixes are like 20%, 22%. So you're just wasting money at that point. Um, you know, I look at some of the brands you can buy, the pellets, and it's just the pellets. Well, I found, though, deer don't like just the pellets. They want something else with it. Yeah. Um, and the nice thing about it is when I get it from Scott, you know, it goes in my big hopper and some of it, as it comes down, it'll break up. So it actually turns into a powder. Well, they love that. You know, you'll, they'll stick their nose because all I have is 
uh, hopefully rednecks listening, hit me up. <laughs> <laughs> I've got it. And it literally go back, check my, check my, uh, invoices. Um, you know, I've, I have eight redneck blinds and I've got five of the gravity feeders. How much will they hold? 750. 750 pounds. So it's a chore. Um, and literally like now it'll last me four days. Well, that's, that was my next question. If you, if you fill it up, how long does it last? Four days in the summertime. And like, once it gets going and once everything starts growing, It'll give me two weeks. Yeah. Uh, which, and that's just once, once the, the horns, you know, once you get to like August, I quit feeding, um, because there's no more really, you know, growth to be had. Maybe September, you know, they start shedding a little bit. And so shedding the velvet. So I don't mess with it after that. But, um, you know, once I start looking at that stuff, I'm like, holy moly. I mean, you're looking at it, you know, I started buying it by the bag, which didn't work out. So I called Scott. Like, hey, can I get this stuff? So he started selling it by the skid. The skid. The only problem is, which I, is a ton. I thought that was my next So question. that's 40 bags. And how much was 40 bags, a ton of that stuff? What's it range? It ranged anywhere from. Well, so, and, and this is another thing, like how we price things is based on it, the, the market value the very, of, yeah. of what things are. For paying a lot for corn, price goes up, obviously, sure. you know. Um, but it can range. You were probably paying. I don't know. I don't remember. On a ton, probably 700, 800 bucks on a ton. Yeah, on a right? ton of it. And you got six ton for. Yeah, this last mix was what? It might have been, what, 2,800 maybe? I think it's it was like, a, it was yeah. like 2,800 bucks to fill up the whole hopper. Because um, the nice thing is, 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 again, what I found out was I will spend more to save more. So the hopper outside, I bought it online, literally showed up in a truck. It was hilarious. It fits in the back end of a semi, and I mean, barely fits in there. So <laughs> we, we pulled that sucker out, put it together, and I mean, it was, a, that, the auger was the most expensive part, like, because you can make it gravity, but I was like, I don't want to get it that high off the ground. So I bought the auger. It was literally like three grand. So what a lot of people don't understand, which I didn't know, was the bag is what costs the money. So we could cut that in half by not buying a bag. So three fill-ups, that's free. So that's where I was at. Well, heck, I had that this summer. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I I cleared that pretty quickly. Well, and then you have a, a, a unique way of filling up your feeders yep. or, or putting out your corn piles and something in the back of your buggy. So if you want to get on and look, it's called uh, Feed Train, I believe. Uh, so that says on their Lex Feed Train. So it's, I knew it was Feed something, but, uh, and it's made for cattle, for guys to just how they, you have those things on the ground and you just roll up, it has its own built-in auger battery, hit the switch. Well, I put it in the back of my Ranger, and we found out real quick, it was just easier to take a five-gallon five, five gallon bucket and just scoop it out and put it, you know, pull right up beside your the feeder, just the scoop it out and put it right in there. Tunnel. Right, because I keep it on the lowest setting. So, I mean, it's probably six and a half, well, maybe seven feet to the top of the feeder. So it's still low enough when you're standing in the back of the side-by-side, -side, it only comes up to, like, my waist. So it's just really a scoop it and scoop it. right i mean even my wife does it and uh you know i can count on on lex if i tell him hey go feed that up where he can come up here you just plug it in the auger starts pull the pull the thing out and it just it just, it have, just have like a, like a three or four inch hose or something mm -hmm. four inch thing comes out and it just has a square thing just turn it on and it just dumps right we in. just we just back up underneath of that feed train mm -hmm. and it just drops it right in there so you don't have to put it into a bed of a truck now again the feed train was thousand bucks somewhere in that region but I looked at what it was saving me, time, because even when I was buying skids, I had to go get them. So I can only carry three at a time on my on my flatbed trailer. So now, then you got to store them. Okay, there it takes up garage space, so I got to listen to the wife. And it's just, then you got mice, and then you put a hole in a bag, and then you're just like, ah, it makes a mess. Yeah. So you guys make this mix that he uses. Do you yep. guys have a, a, a grain truck that comes out and fills up his hopper? Yep, yep. Gotcha. So, um being the feed mill, right? Like, you got it down. 99% of our, or, or, or it's, it's feed, you know? Um, yes, we bag, we bag a lot of feed. Um, but the bulk is the easiest. Um, you know, I, his father in law is, is a customer of ours as well. And he, he uses it to feed his cattle. cattle. Yeah. And that's how I saw it. That's how I saw the, the, he got one. And I'm like, I mean, how does that work? I'm saying that way. You know, save me a bunch of money, too. And I'm like, Oh, I'm down for that. <laughs> you guys ever try like the the dewormer in it? 
so we haven't gotten into that. Yeah, so this is about there, that yet. There are a couple of options I was thinking about as I was driving over here today to um, kind of think about it, improving what we're doing. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, one thing that's that's a big issue for cattle is is flies in the spring. Sure, um, pink eye and, yeah. and all of that. Um, I don't know how big of an issue that is with deer. Um, but the flies are coming. Or as, uh, yeah. You know, so that that could be a, a, another angle that we look at. Um, I haven't thought about the dewormer on, on that side. Well, so Walter met some guys in West Virginia that started doing it, and um, it made a huge difference, didn't it? Yeah, their their uh, field dress weight of their deer increased a lot. They're, really? they're killing really big deer. In West yeah, I mean, 300-pounders in West Virginia. They use an ivermectin. Okay. It's okay. like a it's, yeah. hey, it's like a goat worm about COVID. Around. <laughs> <laughs> right. Jeez, well, we're, 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 we're gonna get canceled before we even yeah. get going here. But I know other guys that use diat- diatomaceous earth <laughs> in yep. there. Yep, and it's, it kind of helps keep it from clumping. Yeah, but it also works as a as a wormer. You know, anything that eats it, it it's like um, it would kills anything, any kind of parasite or whatever. Yeah, that. any kind of parasite or anything with an exoskeleton. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's nice. See, that's where we've just, you know, it's great that you were here talking about this because this is stuff that, like I said, we're building on the fly and trying to figure out. And just by doing what we've done in two years, I've seen, like we're talking about, though, just size of deer are enormous now to me here. And then two year old deer are scoring in the 120s. I mean, I got some giants that I know are only two and three years old. You ever Which, weigh them? Field dressed? What? Wait. Uh, skid steer carries them. Yeah. <laughs> I don't even mess with Brianna weigh them. Is this ball. big? The big one that we were talking about, the form from Illinois. Was that a, was that come off this farm? Yeah, that came off his farm, and he was an absolute. Would you come over and see him when I had him in the? I didn't know. I didn't know. I mean, he was an absolute giant, and thank God he died where we could get the tractor to him. Yeah. There was no dragging him anywhere, and he was he was a lifer. He is only four years old. Uh-huh. So he scores in the mid 170s, and he's four years old. Yeah. And I killed, killed him last year as a three year old because my taxidermist friend, he, he, you know, sent the stuff out to get an idea of where he was at. He was three last year, and that's his, his uh, shed from last year, which we figure he'd be in the 160s. Well, a three year old. Just a huge body, four year old. Just, just enormous. But he lived at the feeder. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he lived at the feeder. So. So how many years have you been doing the implementation of the food plots and your minerals and protein? So food plots and stuff have been going on probably 10 years. Uh, the minerals have just probably been three. Because yeah. once I really got to know Scott, we really then got into this the last two years heavy. with. So have you noticed a, a, a bigger change in your deer in the three years with the minerals 100%. versus the seven years prior to just the food plots? 100%. Even my does. My does will have mm, always two or three. You'll never see a doe with one unless it gets killed, but more likely they all have twins, which you know, then they're healthy. You Plenty know, of food. The twins are making it. And then you look at deer that I've seen other places shoot that are, you know, uh, uh, they shoot it because it's a year. Like mine look like they're, they're two or three year old. I mean, they look just, they're just bigger, their weight, the size. So then you know, then all the plant you're doing, you know, trying to make cover for them, trying to just make life easy. Um, you know, predator hunting, we just try to do it all. Sure. Well, when I was talking to you on the phone the other day, you were saying, you know, like, man, I've really got my farms figured out. Like, all the years of doing it and feeding, you know, probably feeding the same places, same stand setups, like, you know when they're coming. Well, and most people say, oh, I've never killed a big buck out of the feeder. Well, how long have you had your feeder? You know, my feeders have been up there since Redneck has been two, three years. But even before that, I had just your regular you know, gallon feeder from Walmart that held 200 pounds. And you know? their gravity. I say, and I would always, I would always modify, uh, modify them and, you know, put a, put a, uh, a thing for a toilet. Right. Splange on it. And then just make my own, have it come down, put a Y at the bottom and have made my own gravity feeders because the, I was tired of changing batteries. I hated that. Now, yes, do you, you know, you get coon and everything else, but again, we coon hunt, you know, we don't really coon hunt. We, we trap coon and, and, we get it. We, we get them, you know. Yeah. So those have come down on my farm. You know, you, I don't have to worry about that as much. And then in turn, um, I wasn't a real big turkey hunter. Still am not. But now Got the, turkey, turkeys. the turkey the turkey, will eat out of my feeder, which is hilarious. I'll get pictures of them 
just pecking, pecking, it, right, <laughs> pecking it right out of the feeder, which, you know, you got 40, 50 turkey up there and you're just like, wow. You know, and, and then when I buy a farm, I start implementing this stuff and it works. You just see it work. And how big a food plot are you making? As big as I can make it. Uh, so the ones you have now, how big are they? So up top, I've got 25 acres dedicated up top to basically rotating corn and soybeans. And I have maybe a quarter acre uh, clover in the middle. And the big reason the clover is even there um, is for erosion because of how it kind of drains. And then I just had a friend of mine who uh, does logging come and do uh, a five acre food plot at the bottom. Uh, my bottom down there has a cricket once through it and uh, I always thought it was waste down through there. So I just brought him over, he came over and looked at it and he said, oh yeah, let's clean this out. And now I mean, it's absolutely amazing down there. And that's where he shot that goofy buck this year down there because it's in the holla, it's secluded. Uh, and I did mess up, I put the stand in the wrong place, but we'll rectify that. You know, again, you, you think you know where the deer are going to come from, and they always come from a different angle. So, so how many acres is this farm? My farm here is 100 acres. And you got 30 of it or 35 of it in food plots. I do. The rest is just, and, you know, people say, oh, you know, you can't, you don't use your farm then. You don't, you know, use your property. Uh, we ride around every day. They both have four-wheelers. I've got four or five side-by-sides, or two or three side-by-sides. And, you know, especially when it comes then to season, we don't ride as route as much. And they don't chase the deer. Right. We don't do that either. So, you know, it, and they know, like literally, if I go fill up a feeder, 10 minutes later, we'll have deer on camera. I mean, they know, you know, they get used to it. So, you know, I know people say, oh, I don't go on the property to hunt. And I'm like, I forget that. That's why I bought it. You know? Well, I mean, especially your house is here. Well, my house is here. Yeah, Even that's my other things, though. Yeah. We, we still go on those. I, I don't care. I mean, I don't know. I, I look at it as I buy them to use them. I buy them to hunt them. I buy them as an investment. So I'm going to use it. Yeah. It's not hurting, obviously. No, <laughs> no. And then, like I said, deer. since we've started picking it up and uh, some of the other stuff I do with Scott is, you know, you get online and there's the different brands endorsed by Lukoski's and Drury's and all that stuff. Well, that's great. It costs you three times, four times, five times as much as you can get at your local feed mill. Um, and that's the stuff where then, you know, I, I don't know where, you know, everybody's watching this from or your own situation. But, you know, if it's worth coming up to Scott, you know, we've messed with that stuff. You know, I'm kind of like there, you know, we try to do the, the guinea pig of it. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah. let's see what works see and see what action. doesn't work. Yeah. Yeah. So where is your, the mill located? So at? It's, it's right here in Belmont. So it's. It's 10 minutes from, from Chris's property here. Yeah. Um, pretty much service all Belmont County, Monroe, Guernsey, um, over into West Virginia as well. Gotcha. Um, so how far will you take a, a, a truck and fill up somebody's? Um, you're looking at, I mean, heck, we go up to, uh, up in the PA for a couple of customers. Um, Long ways. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're talking like a, an hour and a half one way on, on some of them. You know, it, it's the uh, the feed industry, um, and as farms begin to kind of go away, you know what I mean, from a, a true cattle standpoint and just the, the next generation taking over those farms, you know, um, we have kind of had to adapt to that as well and servicing uh, larger areas. Um, when it comes to um, shipping grass seed and things like that, you know, most of that stuff you can ship LTO, FedEx, whatever, yeah, you know, 50, bag. 50 pound bag and, and send it out. So we can ship that any place. So when the grain truck shows up, what's it look like? How do they offload it? So uh feed truck is, it, it's a, uh, probably technically can hold like 17 ton weight legally. Um, but in the, it, it's got like a tank on the back. Um, inside of that tank, there's three or four baffles. Um, so we can, put different feeds in there really different customers and things like that so you can make one trip one one direction and hit two or three people and it all comes out the bottom like, uh, no it has a swing arm yeah it has it. a swing arm it has so a big, like, big auger up at the top that so that that way you can fill people's feeders and bunk off it and, and different and things you can like switch that. which yeah but it comes out of a hydraulic um the hydraulics control the um the swing arm um, and it's just an auger. And so it does come out of the bottom, but it gets augered to the top, to that 
main uh, office is going into the band. So it's uh, I, as far as I know, they've been been doing it like that for years with with feed. Um, you know, I've worked worked there for about ten years now. Um, it's it's always been the same from that standpoint. Do you guys do anything with like the blocks, like making your own blocks? So we do not make our own blocks. Um, we've recently gotten set up with a, a distributorship. Yep. Um, with uh, it, and and again, it's all based on cattle. But all of those places are able to modify and make a custom yeah. custom block. You know, um, in when I look at all the deer stuff, I, I kind of classify things into t- two different blocks from a feed standpoint. Like you have attractants, which are great for during season, and then you have true feed. You know that that's going to be what is growing and giving the animals the the nutrition that they need. Right. You know, um, and, and that's kind of I, I I don't know if a, a lot of people kind of think in those terms. I mean, I. Like I said, I've, I haven't hunted real long. I, I have a feeder that I throw some corn out at, and deer come to it. <laughs> <laughs> so you're not using the minerals? Yeah, uh, I'm not. Um, and, and like, I'm just not set up for it. I don't personally have the time for it. Um, like but Chris you said, you will. We hope so. Maybe when I retire. Yeah. <laughs> uh, when, when the kids get older, I might have time. You know, yeah. but, because that's the, uh, you know, and I, and I've talked to Chris about this before, like to shoot big deer you have to put in a lot of work right time. like, like you, you look online and, and these guys you have guys hunting public land shooting big deer you got guys on their own farm shooting big deer but no matter what those guys shooting big deer it takes time put in a lot of time yep right um they know the land you gotta look out yeah yep. you it, gotta do your research there's there's a lot of time involved in, in every bit of it well know? guys like chris and you know people that put in that kind of work in the off season they, they kill them in the out season they just shoot them during season yeah that's right. yep yeah. yeah and that's it i mean that's that's the last couple big ones we've killed it's been it and you're hunting out of the the blind right next all the windows closed yep until and time I, to shoot yep and we buy the uh i'm a big fan of the ozonic yeah, you know, I use exotics. I never thought in a million years and on a whim, I was like, you know what, I'm going to try one of them. And them deer circled around me. Now they knew something was up, but they didn't blow. They licked their nose. Yeah, and, their and nose they just and don't blow. And that's it's like, it. oh, man, that's nice. And then when you're hunting with kids and, and when my kids were younger and, uh, you know, even with my wife, like, I was just always, I fell out of a ladder stand. It, uh, it broke away from the tree. Sure. And ever since then, I've been real leery about that stuff. Yeah. And then when my wife's like, yeah, I'll, you know, I'm in. Let's let's go. I'm like, I will pay whatever it is to know. You know, I go one way with a kid. She goes another way with a kid. I know they're safe. Don't have to yeah, worry about Climb up the, the ladder, ladder into that ladder. box and yeah. you can't fall out of it. And that's why I like the rednecks. They're all fiberglass. Fantastic. Well, the in the sink concealment with it's, that is so much better. Not even that. Just move. Oh, movement, noise. Just, sin. You got a kid. I mean, you see my son over there swinging around on the on the <laughs> stool. That is deer. That, that's what yeah. he's doing. Yeah, yeah like like uh, I did put up my first. Uh, well, we saw this deer in my actual side yard of my house, so I was putting corn out and having it come in and get so we can get some close pictures of it. So I put up a ladder stand for him, and uh, he took his compound up and and uh, was it the compound or did you do the do the compound? And then he was sitting there, and he goes, well, how am I supposed to shoot it? I said, welcome to the real deer. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> you were welcome. Now, you have to practice like I used to when I didn't have you, and we could actually do that, and you didn't play on every travel team we could find. You know, it, it just makes a difference. It's hard to get the shot out of a tree stand, especially so, on a corn pile. So what about you? You hunting out of a blind or a hang-on so, or you shooting crossbow? So I shoot a compound, and then uh, I hunt out of a tree saddle. So okay. most of the time I'm just picking a tree and climbing it. Uh, gotcha. I hunt my neighbor's farm. Yeah. For somebody that just started hunting, to hunt out of a tree saddle right off the <laughs> rip is kind of surprising. <laughs> um, but then I, when I take my kid, my son, um, we have a blind that we hunt out of. On the ground? On the ground. Yeah. 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 So it's uh, the, the saddle hunting. Originally, I didn't know where I was going to be able to hunt. So, like, I went hunting this one time with, with my buddies. And then I, I get the bug, I go buy a bow, like, oh yeah, a whip, yeah, yeah, you know, and like start <laughs> shooting. Um, and I didn't know where I was going to be able to hunt. So putting up tree stands, having blinds wasn't even, wasn't feasible. It wasn't in my mind. So, um, start 
looking online and find the tree saddle and I'm like that's a pretty cool way to go about it so how long you say you've been in the feed business so i've worked at belmont mills for 10 years for ten. so in that 10 year span you were talking about how like traditional cattle farms and stuff are kind of like fading away mm -hmm. but how much of that space has been taken up by deer hunters like chris and so it's uh it's helping gain some of the market yeah you know um th there are still many major cattle farms and things like that it is the um yeah you know, the smaller guy um you know the the price of feed the price of all the inputs like to just take care of your hay fields is is crazy expensive you know? oh yeah um so so that's you know just pushing some people well just speaking of that you know every year i get at least four to whatever that hopper holds of lime yeah and lime my that's what i was going like, to deliver like you, live you, to. yeah you have to because again and it was nice and and i think it was the biggest thing that 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 i've that me and scott have really got down to is i didn't know about that like not about just that but just belmont mills in general that your local co-ops and stuff might be a whole lot cheaper than well, I think there's the probably stuff like you think you walk into Royal King or some outdoor store or Walmart oh that stuff's cheap no it's not it's not even close yeah to what I buy it off of Scott for and it's just I think the biggest thing is though is there's a local co-op or a feed store within you know a decent range of most places but people just don't know about it yes yeah, yes. yeah I, it, that's it's there are tons of places across the state right. doing exactly yeah, you know. and they'll all pretty much do what you do. If I walk yeah. in and say, hey, I got an idea, or if I come in and say, I want this, this, and this mixed with something, you can do it. Yeah. Well, literally, I stole a tag off of one, and it had all the breakdown on it. And I'm like, mm -hmm. well, why wouldn't I just use this? But I don't want this, this, and this. And then I ask him, hey, what do you think? Well, I think we should put this in there, you know, calcium, uh, whatever. You know, it ends up being in my mix, and I'm like, perfect. So now I've got my own mix. At a quarter of the price. Oh. Like I said, we're, we're looking at here, and the ones you buy online, I did some research today looking. Um, we'll just put Antler Max. You can figure out who it is. You know, for a ton of it, you're talking 18 or uh, uh, basically $1,100. $1,100. For a ton. For a ton. And, you, and I'm buying six ton for 2800 $2, Yeah. So it doesn't take you real quick to learn that you're $6,600 and I'm paying $2,800. Big difference. Big difference. You know, yeah. so then it does seem feasible to do this. Now, I understand a lot of guys aren't going to be like me and put that kind of money in the deer, but when you're even talking about some of the other stuff that these places bake, I mean, you're looking at clover for a 36-pound bag, 250 bucks. And as we said before, that was, they say it covers four acres. I plant that on like half acre because you want it to come in thick because the weeds outgrow it. You, you can't do it fast enough. So... I'm spending 250 bucks on half an acre where I can buy a whole lot more of a Scott in a 50 pound bag for a fraction of the price. Well, and it's the same stuff. It's the same stuff. We, I, I put in a food plot this year. There's probably close to just like maybe an acre. And I literally went to tractor supply and bought a couple bags of stuff. And I'm like two little bags. It was like a hundred bucks. And as I'm like planting that field, I'm like, there's just no way, no way, no way this is going to be enough to cover it. Yeah. And it grew in like crap. Yeah. Well, in, in all, all your local co-ops, you know, so I started out in sales there. I don't really have an agronomy background. I don't have an animal nutrition background, you know, learning on the job, researching people like Chris ask, asking me questions. Yeah. You know, um, but like, like you say, all of the the seeds that are in all these big brands like something similar i can get my hands on you know and and i can give you a realistic application rate of what you need to put down you know it's so my question is 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 it possible for these companies that are, are making this to create a better seed than what you have because like walter and i were talking about it earlier years ago and this probably changed a lot because it's been 15 years but he bought this brand like off the shelf mm -hmm. big name brand name brand and we and we planted it and it grew awesome two feet tall it got really tall and then he went to a local feed store and did the same thing you did chris handed them the label and it could just been the feed store i don't know but they mixed it gave it to him and we planted it and it didn't grow hardly at all so there's a lot that plays into it right um your soil 
you know, soil sampling is a, a key to any time you're planting. This was planted in the same, 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 spot. Spa, same spot. So there are different varieties. So let's just take brassicas, all right? There are, I, I couldn't even tell you how many varieties. Um, different varieties are, will do better in different climates, different zones, different mm -hmm. things like that. Usually your local co-op should have, or your local local store should have things in, in varieties that will grow well in your area. Right, you know? right. I, I, that's that. So that kind of shocks me that 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 would happen. Well, and it, who knows? It could have been old seed. It could it, have been it, variety. It, no idea. Well, it just didn't grow the same. Yeah. The other thing that I found out too is is you know I used to just put whatever fertilizer any of the places had for sale. Mm -hmm. You know, like what? oh, it's it's triple ten, it's triple nine, it's triple. Well, but it, now, it it varies. It's, well, now it's okay. Hey, you're putting this down. You need to put, and I didn't know how much. You know how how much am I putting down on my quarter acre? What what, what does that look like? Well, soybeans take higher phosphorus and lower everything else. So now, and these are all things I, that you can help with. Yeah, that's right. Look, well, guys, yeah. tell you that you bring in a couple of bags of dirt from a couple of different spots. Test it out. Tell me what I need to do. Do you guys test it there? So we uh, we send it out to a lab to be yeah. tested. We don't have a lab on on site. Um, but but the biggest thing is your pH level. Mm -hmm. um, you, you know, and that's all all based on your lime. Um, if your pH isn't in the right right zone, you know that sweet spot six five to seven two, it lock the ground locks up nutrients. So it doesn't matter how much fertilizer you put down. It doesn't yeah, work. It's oh, not yeah. not going to get to the plant the way that it needs to. It doesn't move through the soil the way it should. So, so. I'm planning on putting in a couple small food plots, like quarter acre, mm -hmm. and then in like two spots. Um, what should I do first? Test. So dirt? first thing you're going to want to do is test the soil. Um, More than one spot. So so let's say you're doing a quarter acre. You want to take like like five plugs around that quarter acre. Um, you don't want it to be the best looking spot. You don't want it to be the worst looking spot. You want to stay away from fence rows, different things like that. Just really mix it up, really random. Yeah, right. Um, and then with whatever you're planting, most grasses, clovers, everything, it's going to be in the top four inches is what you're concerned with. You don't want, not concerned. The roots don't go much deeper. Your, your roots aren't going to get a whole lot deeper than that. Um, so take some plugs and, and, and four inches, you put them in a plastic bag. What size is a plug when they say a plug? So it, it uh, handful or so, so when I say plug, we have a, uh, a core, like a punch. Yeah. Um, if you don't have a core punch, if you take a, a spade shovel and, and give yourself like a, an inch sliver and then kind of cube it again. Right. And, and that'll get you. Not a lot. Yeah. No, it's not a lot of dirt that we need. Like a, basically a coffee cup full. And you want those samples in separate bags? You can put them in the same bag. All right, yeah, the same bag, but it's the same. It's going. It's going to be the same. Exactly. It's going to give you a representation of the oh, entire. So if I had like a so label that food plot one for that lot for that lot, and then you go to the next one. All right, that's the bottom plot. So if I had a ten acre lot, would you take different samples from? So you for sections? for a ten acre plot, you would want to take. Uh, you want to split it in half. You usually want to do about a five acre yeah, at a time, um, and this is something that is a, a good practice is if you have a, a landmark. Um, so like say, say that 10 acre plot has a, a, a water drainage right through the center of it and get half and half, you know what I mean? Right. Something like that right. so that you can, uh, really know which, which samples came from which side of it. Um, and, and for food plots and, and especially on those smaller plots, your pH is going to be the main thing that you're going to adjust. Excuse me. What you're planting is what dictates your fertilizer. Like Chris right. was saying, soybeans need a lot of um, potassium. For, so you're going to want a 92330, something that doesn't have a lot of nitrogen. It's bumped up on the back end. Um, that that's where your fertilizer side of it comes comes to play. Um, but your pH, they can't preach it enough about checking the pH on your soil and in in knowing what you need to put down to get your pH. Well, and, I, and I'll give you an example. So before I met Scott, I would plant corn. Now I would rotate it with the soybeans. Well, that was my and, next question with you. And I would, I mean, I would triple 19 that bad boy out and it would grow four, five foot tall. That's it. Maybe have one, two ears on it. 
Now, I didn't have the best corn planter at the time, and I would get, uh, and most people don't know, your local soil and water, uh, they usually have one that you can, you just need a tractor to pull it because you need the hydraulics. You can pull with a truck, but you just need the hydraulics to lower the tire down while you lower the whole machine down, and then the, the gravity will, will uh, you know, the ground pulling it will do it. Um, but I was basically, like he was saying, wasting fertilizer, just blowing money because they weren't growing. So now the last three years that we've been doing this, uh, two years heavy, my corn's seven, eight foot tall now, how it should be. And I'm getting, you know, two, three, whatever it is. The yield's a lot better. Oh, uh, it's, it's quadrupled. Yeah. And so I'm what, spending less money, you know, cause I'm planning it better. I, I'd spend a little bit of money, bought a modified two seater. So basically the big 10 corn feeder, you know, thing I've got out to one that pull up will be on my tractor. So it takes me a while. But I can maneuver it into smaller places and stuff like that. But again, it plants it better. But now my soil's better. We don't waste money on, you know, um, you know, all my fields. I, I know where I plant, so then we know what it is. And you still rotate your corn and beans every year. Yep, every year. Yep. Are you treating your plots with uh, pelletized lime or pulverized? Pelletized. So okay. pelletized lime is just. A lot easier application. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, does the lime take? I, I was always told it takes a year to show up. So, there is so pulverized lime or ag lime, right? The white lime. The white lime. Yes. Um, it is a larger particle. Okay. So, rain hits it, gets down into the soil. Basically, that is going to affect your pH for a longer period of time, just because of the size of the particle and how long it takes to break down. Pelletized lime has a, it, it's faster acting because that it, you're just taking the ag lime and pulverizing it down to a smaller particle. And then you rebind it up into that pellet. As soon as water hits it, all those fine particles are in the soil. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So it affects your pH or makes a difference. It results a lot faster, faster, but again, it doesn't last as long, you know? So, so you probably end up doing it every year. You can't end up or your this, sample. Depending on how the pH is, what type of ground it is. Um, you know, up here we have a lot of a lot of strip ground. Um, and that really affects how things are. If it's in the middle of the woods, you're gonna have to put a lot of a lot of lime down in most cases. And um, you just keep pounding the lime until you get it the pH down to what you want it. Yeah. Yeah. So have you have you messed with any of the muscantis? Have not. Have or you or the switchgrass? Or the switchgrass. So so we uh so yeah, okay. We deal with switchgrass. Um, are you looking at it from the standpoint of like cover? Yes. Okay. So so a couple of different ones that that we've messed around with um, some sun sun hemp, some Egyptian wheat. Uh, How tall does it get? Six foot, seven foot. Um, uh, another buddy of ours um, has planted it, and he uses it as a blind from the roadway. Yeah, so the people it exit or well, no cover he, from poachers. Yeah, people just driving, just seeing, seeing deer, yes. right? Um, and then he's he's used it as entry and exit. He's he has a uh, a very organic method to, towards the whole thing, um, like no spraying, anything like that. So he's um, he's used some buckwheat, some stuff that will choke out the weeds, um, and then he'll plant a fall plot. Um, you know, he's done some peas and some different things and, and uses the buckwheat as a mulch to cover the um, the fall plot to, to it grows and, and things like that. So a lot of different ways to go about it. Well, I've, I've studied food plots more this year and online and watch videos and podcasts of it than I ever have before. And some of these guys like Don Higgins and Chris Brackett and those guys have really come up with like an architecture to it. I yeah. mean, just to, yeah. you know, they, they'll... So many feet around the field edge was one thing, and then they they go into the muscantis and switch grasses, and then in the corn and beans, and it's just it's different rows basically to funnel these deer and the entry and exit of it. And, well, and that that's uh, they're they're using it for 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 travel lanes for the deer as well, correct? Mm -hmm. Right, so that they have cover where they're where right. they're eating and and things like that. So and deer are grazers; they like to eat while they walk. Okay. Yeah, so long, narrow food plots. They yep. enter here and they eat all the way through. Yeah. Well, that's my bottom plot. It's like that. but And it also depends on here. I don't have that because of the way my, my farm lays. 
with the valleys and the, the sheer cliffs and some other things. I don't have that luxury to do that. Um, but my farm in Illinois, I had, um, I definitely did that. Yeah, it's a much different yeah, it's a, it's, land you have out there. To out there. And if you bump a deer from, from your patch of woods, it's two miles away to the next patch of woods. Because uh, I, oh, I was in Pike County and uh, right there on the border with Adams. And, I mean, that's just how the hunting is out there. It, it just, it is. Uh, Pike County actually is, is the terrain's a little more like this here. It is. It than is. other parts of Illinois. And my farm was like up on the cliffs. Uh, they called it the bluffs, and then it was down into the ag ground, uh, which was good because the deer lived in the ag ground all year long until they cut it. And then as soon as they cut it, that's when we went out to hunt. Yeah. Because you wasted your time if you went early season. They were there. Until they cut the corn down or soybeans, whatever it was that year, didn't matter. That's when they went into the cliffs and, and, and into the woods. So Everywhere I'd, I'd ever hunted in Illinois was all the same. It was pretty much all flat, little draws, a lot of ag land or whatever. And then I went to Pike County a couple of years ago, and I was like, it's just solid hardwoods. Like, there's not hardly any ag around. It's... Well, you think it's flat, you ought to go to Kansas where we're at here. <laughs> or in northeast Kansas, well, central east Kansas by, uh, and I mean, it is flat. 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 There <laughs> is no getting around it. There's no hiding. It is flat. So that's big out there, too, because uh, most of the things it is, it's just it's just uh, creek beds. I mean, that's literally what you're you're trying to figure out where they're coming from. Uh, in my farm, I got out there. Luckily, uh, my farm had all the trees, and that's what I was looking for when I bought it. Was I wanted the woods? I wasn't interested in paying, you know, three, and the differences too out there. You can buy a farm. I bought mine. I, I mean, I'll tell you, I I spent three grand an acre, uh, but I didn't want to spend three grand an acre for field that I'm not going to do anything. Right. It's like, the tillables. Yeah. Like, I, I don't care about that. Oh, we'll give you a thousand dollars. I don't. That doesn't still help me. Like. Right. I want you to leave it. If you're going to plant it, then just leave it. But uh, so I was lucky enough to, to find one. And uh, my buddy, which which uh, Scott knows too, he's got several thousand acres out there. And I mean, it's now I, I think if you had game. I think if you had a big enough chunk out there with enough tillable on it, it would still make sense to have the well, farmer come in and lease that. And then he'll leave some acreage for you for where well, you want. I'm going to be honest with you. I thought that was it. And that's the stuff me and, me and Scott talk about too. I thought like, okay, yes, I have a hundred acres here, and I was lucky enough to put my parcel together with with some of my neighbor uh, when she wanted to sell. But I like having my twenty, thirty acres in different plus, and now they've got different deer, herds different deer, because different I, I, options. Yeah, because some of the other ground around here has come up for sale, and it doesn't make sense. It's the same deer. They they stay on me. Why would I want to buy that? Like that doesn't make sense to me. So that's been my game plan, and that's that's my buddies out there in Illinois. Uh, we've kind of got out of Illinois, but out in Kansas now, you know, it's we want farms everywhere. What but, made uh, you get out of Illinois? The the basically the age class of deer is what it is. Uh, the one you see behind me here on the mantle that was split because uh, I it was just skull and I it, uh, one dropped, dropped it. it. But that deer is a like two and a half, three year old deer. The problem is you don't see the five, six year old deer anymore out there hmm. because you go to the diner and there's, I mean, we're from Ohio and then there's all these guys from everywhere else. But the difference is, is we own the ground and these guys are just coming in to hunt, which the thing that struck me about both those places, though, like Illinois and Kansas is most people don't hunt the people that live there. The people that live there. Which is crazy to me. Like I was like, man, I mean, if I look, but then again, I guess. I, All there is is farming to do. Like that's your job. Like you, you don't have time to hunt. I mean, I think the problem that you're referring to is all these out-of-state hunters coming and you know overpopulating these states. But any state that's starting to be known for whitetail is going to have the same problem. Well, Ohio's having it, which I think Ohio is doing the right thing. They're bumping their out-of-state license a percentage every year. Was it for like five years, Walter? I think so it was like 180 bucks or whatever i think they're going to take it to like 350 oh, I hope which i think i think it helps the thing with illinois too is you can hold up illinois is 500 well, and you can still shoot two bucks though you yeah. can shoot one with bow and one with shot one with shotgun. So straight well straight wall cartridge now yeah, yeah. so it, it doesn't make yeah i mean you're gonna kill there's just too many deer to be killed because let's be honest if you're going out there and you're paying some of these outfitters or whatever you lease a ground you know, oh, we got a 140 class limit, blah, blah, blah. You don't care. You paid all that money. 
four grand, you're going to shoot it. What's another 500 bucks if you're in it four grand? Yeah. I'm going to get a trophy because chances are most of those people are coming back. Um, I looked at it a little different, but, you know, it, it still was the same thing. I didn't kill a deer out there for three years. It wasn't for lack of effort. It was just for lack of deer. Well, I got bigger deer at home. Like, yeah. I come out here because I thought this was the land of giants. And don't get me wrong, we saw a few, but not like you see in Kansas. And uh, the biggest thing that struck me about Kansas the first year I went there was, I would, you know, I'm an early riser anyway, and I'd get up, ride around with my friend's dad because he was always up in the morning too. And literally, I'd ride around for two, two and a half hours and not see a soul, not pass one car, not see one person. And I'm like, yeah, this is, this is the place to be because there's no one there hunting. And it's starting to get that way now. But what Kansas has also done, uh, a lot of the guys that would go with us, um, they have to draw a lottery. That was my, I thought that was some kind of lottery. But it's like, does it take two years or is it guaranteed as long as you're in it early? No, no, it's not. It's random. So there's no point system or nothing. It's just random. Uh, We always go out for the early muzzleloader because it's kind of before everything kicks off here. It's September still. And it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's hot, hot. Is hot, but the deer, you know, they're used to it out there. So, you know, we've killed some some very big deer out there. Uh, you know, my buddy's got a 200 out there, several 1 wow. is a 190 this year. So, you know, he, but you got a lot of ground. You ought to. <laughs> yeah. But again, you know, you, you look at that though, and you, I mean, deer hunting has become so commercialized. I mean, you, you see what, what I'm trying to do here with Scott, and you're looking around like, why isn't anybody else doing this? Well, there are. <laughs> yeah. So now you're starting to see, well, hey, starting outdoor. Hey, Scott, hey, go look at this lick tub down there. See if you can get that because I think that would work and make it to where, you know, you're, you're not relying on these other, these big outfit companies selling you something that costs pennies for dollars. Try to keep it local. Yeah. yeah. I think it that's, nice. I think, and, that, and that's part of like our sales pitch in general, right? Okay. Like it's a local family owned business. You know, in the world we live in today with all the big box stores. Um, so we need it local. We support those local businesses. Um, that's who's, who supports the, the livelihoods. So, you know, we have about 45 employees. And How long has it been around? Since 1888. Fifth, wow. uh, fifth generation, uh, family owned. Where do you guys get your, your, your corn and your grain? It comes from all over the place. Any, like, local farms? So there are. Um, there's, there's a number of local farms that um we'll, we'll purchase corn from um you know in the past couple of years the, the corn price has been been outrageously high um so it's it's been a been a battle and then then it's been short as well like even finding corn available to purchase yeah. has been tough um you know this year prices on, on the corn's coming down um we'll see what happens it it's it's a crazy crazy market that i never thought i'd even think about in my life (laughs) you know um but it it affects everything so fertilizer prices right now are um holding pretty flat uh staying where they're at because in the united states they don't expect as much corn to be planted as normal so that in turn means fertilizer sales will be lower than normal um so does that mean higher prices for corn next year most likely, most likely, because there's less being there, grown. There, there will be less, uh, less supply, right? So you have it, it. It it just goes back to supply and demand. And when you're talking corn and fertilizer, it's a global global market. Are you having trouble getting fertilizer? Um, we are not. Um, it's uh, we stocked up. What four years ago we built a new fertilizer plant. Um, so it used to be we could only. Um, fill fertilizer buggies and, and super sacks, the big one-ton sacks with, with fertilizer. Um, we've now gotten into doing 50-pound bags. Um, and that has allowed us to wholesale our fertilizer to other small co-ops like ourselves. You know, we used to have to buy it um, from a company up in up in near Cleveland um, for all of our bag product, and now we just bag it ourselves. And now you can supply it. To, like, yep. Gives you another revenue. Yep, yep. And, and same with the, the grass seed. Um, we used to buy and resell that. Um, and, and we've gotten into uh, bringing it in straight from Oregon. Most of the grass seed in, in the country comes from, from Oregon or Canada. Um, bring it in, blend it up ourselves, and, and go that route with you, it. You guys do the roasted soybeans? We do have roasted soybeans. We, uh, we, we don't process any of that stuff at, at our place, though. So, you know, it's, 
It, it's um, shipped in. Yeah, yeah. We we purchased that all out outside. You ever try those, Chris? You know, we had it in one of the mixes, um, but to be honest with you, the price then of it is. It, I have no idea what. It, it, it's more expensive, but like I said, I was trying to find something that was relatively close to a bag of corn. You know, if a bag of corn was ten bucks, if I'm sorry, I can't be paying you know fifty bucks then for one bag of stuff like this, and especially like if they like it more. Well, yeah, and I mean, you want to keep the deer there. Uh, there was a spot where, like I said, it took me a minute to find my my. Uh, matter of fact, we just as we were talking, I just found that shed this year. Uh, actually, just about you know a couple of days ago from my deer I killed last this year from last year because something happened. I either didn't get corn or I didn't get my mix and I think it was because of me I went out of town or something well the feeders were empty for like two three weeks well those deer were gone then you know they went off to find something to eat and then they didn't they come back and they you know already dropped their sheds and that's the other thing though that's crazy like all the other people around me lost sheds right off earlier yeah mine just started no pressure. so they they hold Healthy. their yeah they hold them longer they low stress Yep, and you just try to, you know, do it. And I, like I said, I watched Lee do the the fogging with his deer out there, uh, and that makes sense. Now we might have to look into maybe some of that stuff to see. But like I said, my deer are healthy though. Like I can't, I can't complain. Like I said, we did something that's economical. Uh, it's really not. Let's be honest. <laughs> <laughs> there's, nothing, there's, not, there's nothing cheap about yeah, it. Yeah, let's, let's be honest. And everybody asks me, "Oh, you got a farm? What do you raise?" I tell them, "Deer." Deer. That's right, and, and we and we tough. try to harvest two or three a year. <laughs> yeah, and, and that's the the part that impresses me about what Chris has done here. Like, shot four mature, you know, okay. big deer off of his farm this year. Like, you're doing something right if you get four deer on on off, off one property, bro. Right. You know, well, we have older did it this year. Him, his daughter, his wife, they all killed. Yeah, but not on farms that we own, though. Unfortunately. Yeah. Well, that was the thing that I found out real quick when I was in, in college and I was starting to get into the hunting too. Just, I wanted to own my own ground because then no one could tell me, you can't do this. You can't do that. You can't plant this. I don't want you to tear that up. They can't tell you. Yeah. So I always made it a goal when I was in college. Everybody had a picture of, you know, a car they wanted or whatever. And I had a map of Belmont County. <laughs> and they used to make fun of me. And I said, I want to own a piece of that. Like, that was just my my goal in life, and it was funny. All my all my friends moved away, you know, spent two fifty three hundred thousand on a quarter acre lot in whatever city they went to. Yeah, I stayed here, made it work, traveled for work, but I bought ground that was a lot cheaper than that. And then let's be honest, I mean, I'm not a rocket science on how I made money, and oil and gas came. I mean, who knew at that time? So I was lucky enough to to get into that, and then you know, smart enough to reinvest in things that are going to make you money because i don't care unless you're like nancy pelosi you ain't making money at the stock i don't care who you are i don't care unless you got her her guy her investment guy you got you all right. ain't making money in yeah. the stock market yeah, so right. i put it in land and and to be honest with you you know that's that's where i've made then even more money is buying and selling these farms all over the country that's it's, great it's, i mean it's something it's, to enjoy well, that's it. You get to go hunt it. You get to, you know, take, take the, kids. the kids. You get to, you know, the one farm you tracked on for me, you know, I kept it for two years. Biggest buck on it was the one that, that, that I couldn't find, and that one probably scored 140, you know, 150 at best. And it was just, it was an old deer, so we tried to harvest it. And other than that, there was nothing there. So, you know what? You sell it. Move on to something else. Make your money, buy something else, and, and kind of go from there. So that's always been my my uh, my goal in in getting stuff and then meeting Scott and, and get out know, with his son and getting him and T getting a, give T a shot out on his first buck this year, you know, and it's, that's what makes it fun. That's what makes it fun for me that. Oh man. You know, How old is he? He's 12. The same age as Lex. So, and it's so like, I mean, we've, Chris and I have talked about it, you know, so our boys are both big into baseball. Lex plays a bunch of sports and we spend a lot of time with them doing sports right now right but at some point the sports end and yeah well, what is something you can do with your kids farther down the line to right and then you know 18 years old 22 years old if they go to college play whatever but it's it's just something that you can share with your kids um for for a long time you know um 
the the ability to do that and have something that you both love and enjoy okay. and, and, and and you get to spend a lot of time a lot right? more time together spend a lot of time with those that's kids. a lot of fun too you know i've had a lot of hobbies in my life and i played sports growing up and stuff but he took me to shoot my first deer when i was four years old and that's still the only thing i think about every single day <laughs> <laughs> yep I, that's and it's been a lot since then yeah well, that's i remember the first time i went i was at it was it was his grandfather's farm that another guy then purchased but uh and I'll tell you, that guy is, is he told me he was selling him all the ground. It was, it's enormous. It's it's a thousand acre farm. And uh, that guy still holds to this day. I could call him and ask him, hey, can I go over there and hunt? And he would tell me, yeah, because that was the deal when they sold it. And I give it to that guy every time I see him that he is a man of his word. Um, and I still remember, and that tree stand is still there to this day. I can walk you right to it, that my dad stood on it and I sat in a little V in it and waiting for that doe to come by and, nice. you know, shoot it and just have that experience with him. And he's no longer with us. And, you know, looking back at that stuff though, and, and I was like, man, that was, you know, the, the, the ticket, like, you know, that was, I mean, he played baseball till he was in his forties. I mean, and I played in the, you know, looking back, I played with him at a game, you know, I was 16, he was 42, uh, or I don't even know what he was, 36, because we were 20 years apart and uh, had me young. And, you know, looking back at that, it's like, man, that's crazy because there's no way I can play baseball <laughs> now. I can't pick my arm up. Um, but I look back at that stuff, and, and he was a big fisherman, and he would go on these trips, and I wouldn't go. Because I was like, oh, man, I ain't going to fish a lot. I ain't got crappie fishing down here in Tennessee, Georgia. I'm like, but I missed it, you know, and not till later in life here, that I went, you know, my buddy talked me into going out west, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk Scott into going out with us, and just having that guy's trip. I mean, we have more fun just jacking around and, and you know, just being guys mm -hmm. and doing fun stuff. And I miss that. So yeah, you that's know, what we talk about. We oh miss. yeah, we used to go do just, all kinds. Yeah, of stuff. Yeah, miss it. So that's what I'm starting with him. We're gonna go elk hunting, and and I told Scott we're gonna have to take the you know boys out west, just do something like that because the sports will end at some point. At least, at least do something once a year like that. Yeah, just something to, to get outdoors, and then that's why the tattoo has everything he liked to do, and, and Lex is a huge fisherman, and it's just, I don't have the patience for it. Scott will tell you that. My <laughs> patience are thin, especially at, for umpires and referees. <laughs> and everybody else. Is. You don't have to have near as much patience to catch fish as you do shoot whitetail, though. No. Well, hey, I don't know what it is about the whitetail. I used to tell people I'd hunt because it was cheaper in therapy. Well, it's definitely, I should go, <laughs> I should just go to therapy more. now. It would be, be way cheaper than, uh, you know, you build a building and put all this stuff in. I mean, how stupid are you? But, uh, you know, it is what it is at that point. And then you meet people along the way, like Scott, that we've, uh, you know, tried to perfect these things. And I'm glad y'all reached out to me yeah. to, to do this stuff too, because I didn't know, you know, I've been doing this alone. My dad wasn't a big hunter. He was a gun hunter. That's all he cared about. Mm -hmm. He didn't care. Uh, not till right before he died that, uh, you know, he started bow hunting, but again, it was because, hey, once you come get in the blind, yeah, I'll go in the blind. There's a heater in there. Oh, yeah. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Perfect. You know, he'd be in there, have a big chew in, you know, and <laughs> he didn't care. Scent control, nah, that's all right. I never washed this jacket since I bought it from Walmart. You know, he didn't care about the Under Armour, or Sitka, and all that other crap. He just didn't care. It just wasn't his thing. But you look back and I'm like, so I figured all this out, you know, trial and error. And now that I have somebody helping me with it and, and just even with you guys with tracking, stuff you know oh it's a network yeah. yeah you meet a lot of good people the more people you know yeah. and, and connections like what you do and what we do and, yeah the hunting and fishing ties it all together this makes so many memories <laughs> i mean does. i've met guys from tracking and other jobs and stuff i've done and then end up be friends with them and uh, be out in illinois deer hunting with them the next year you know that's even the guy that does all the stuff in illinois for me he literally i parked on one side of the road he parked on the other, the road, you know, the road split us. He pulled in and this was his family farm. This was my farm. And he just saw me the one day. He's like, Hey, what kind of gun's that? And I'm like, well, it's a custom muzzle loader. Don't worry about it. You know? And we start talking next thing, you know, I'm leasing ground off of his friend and he gets all my corn out. He puts stands up for me and <laughs> you know, but it's all for the love of, yeah. of hunting because then in turn, I'm like, okay, I'm out here for gun season. I'm done. Or I bow hunting. I'm done. And Hey, go over there. I don't care. Like, I'm not that kind of guy either. Like, I don't live there. Like, I wouldn't let anybody 
you know, when I want him to come over and kill any of these deer, but deer out there, I mean, you live there. Kill them all. I don't care. Right. Yeah. You're going out there a week yeah. or two out of the year. Yeah. I don't care. Kill them all. I get along with almost every hunter. Yeah. You know, in 17 years, I've walked through the woods with over 2,500 different people and made a bunch of friends, but I get along with every one of them. I don't, have, awesome. I don't have trouble with any of them. Hunters, deer hunters especially. Usually, you, you know, great you, people. You, I've never, I had an issue with a few of them, but it's been, hasn't been my issue. It's been their issue. Either they lied to me or the one neighbor just, she was not very nice. <laughs> I don't know. Again, I told her, like, what's your problem? I'm here five days a year. Was she a deer hunter? Yeah. Was she? And she recently really? just got into it. And that was the thing. My farm blocked her from her farm. Like, I held the keys to her farm. And if she deer hunts long enough, the shoes will be on the other feet. Oh, don't worry. I sold that farm and made a killing. <laughs> Did she buy it? Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I hope she watches this out in Illinois. I might I might have to text this to her. She has to let me know. And uh, she know what I paid for it and I gave her a one time twenty four hours you have to decide because this will be the only time you'll ever own this farm in your life. Yeah. So, and she didn't want to buy it, then you better pony up. Here's the price. And she came to her wits and knew that that farm was the key to what she needed to do. And and then, you know, I mean, to be honest with you, I mean I don't know what her problem was. If she wasn't an idiot, the other guy would have sold it to her instead of me. Like, but if you go and be ignorant though to people and you're not nice to people, and even now I bought this, I mean, everyone's like, oh, I can't believe you bought that. You know, I can't believe them guy sold that to you. I'm like, oh, I, you know, what would you do? Or uh, I asked him. Yeah. <laughs> Called him up and said, hey, you guys interested in selling that? I know you got that piece. There's been a lot of farms that have. People have said that they can never be sold to certain families, yeah. you know, just because of the feuds over the years yeah. and things like that. Uh, and it's just, it, it's over the years, too. You're talking about just being nice to people, and, and Scott will tell you what his neighbor that he hunts. You just go and ask. Just oh, ask. yeah. Be right up front with people. Can, you know, at the farm that you tracked on with me and, and you tracked on with me, we hunt on. The guy's 76 years old, lives by himself, no family. And that's what I'll tell him, listen, you need anything, I go over, talk to him, take my skid steer over, clean up trees. You know, I, I gave him my big brush hog I had because I just didn't use it. I bought another one. You know, I hope you out. You know, I appreciate you letting me hunt. And it's just like, that's what you know, that, that was shocking to him because the other guys he had before that, you know, they'd show up in October and never say a thing to him. And I'm like, I'm not that kind of guy. I mean, how he came to Christmas, he comes over to Thanksgiving. I mean, <laughs> like, you know, I mean, that's the kind of people we everybody's in it for the same thing yeah, you know? I mean, it's, it's the enjoyment of it yeah i keep every year i make my food plot a little bigger over there i said that's less grass you got cut don't worry about it i take care of that side you take care of that side so, so what we get there. when starting that food plot what would you recommend planting so just, clo just simple clover's easy last clover. clo clover's easy it's perennial what yeah. kind of clover usually white white your your, your red clovers um it I'd really suggest like a mix uh, of a couple different types of white clover and red clover in there. Um, your red clover in the first year usually has the most vigor to it, um, but it dies off over time. You got probably about five years on a on a red clover. Um, white clovers will be there till forever, you know, and, unless you let the the grass and weeds get get too high and over. Now, should we frost seed this every That's year? what I was going to say. Over top of that, I I do. So the, the clover is a great seed to frost seed um, because of the size of the seed and the weight of it. It's a it's tiny, it's dense, it's going to get itself down into the soil. So it's a a, a great way to go about help keep that clover patch going. Yep. Yep. Once once it grows to a certain height, do you mow it? See, I've heard some people say that they mow it and then it thickens it back up. And But we did it this year. We planted one and it looked beautiful until we mowed it. The and only, then when it grew back, it was so full of weeds. Like The only time I mow mine is when they start to die. The the, the actual, not the leaf, but the, the flowers. flowers. Yeah. And I I barely, I just kiss it. Just I, don't, I don't cut it way just down. Cut I just cut the flowers off. I just kiss the top of it yeah. so it's still thick and i use which i probably shouldn't but i do i use my skid steer with the with the brush cutter out front so i'm not i'm cutting it before i lay it down and you do this real late in the evening so you don't kill the bees yep. <laughs> and actually i looked into doing bees until i found out my neighbor has one across the road that's so great. good yeah i was good because i was gonna put a bee nest up here but but no they're they're in it all the time but i just take the top layer like some of them guys cut it down and 
I had the same issue. Like I was like, oh, I had to replace sure. the whole thing. Allowed the sun to hit the ground, the wheels yeah. to grow. Up. That's, yeah. The the other thing with clover is the timing of when you cut it. Like if yes. if you mow it and then it's dry for a week, yep. it's it's gonna you set really it good. back. It's gonna set it back. I so always mow it before, before our rain. rain. Yeah. Always mow mine before the rain. I think maybe we just mowed ours too short. Yeah. yeah. And that helps, and that that'll get you too. You know, it it will. Because I was in the same token. I'm like. I mowed it down to one year, and I'm like, well, it didn't grow back. Or it grew back half the size. I'm like, well, that's stupid. You know, the leaves weren't as big. So then the next year, again, I'm just messing with it. So I just took the top off, and it happened to be before it rained, and I'm like, yep, that's the way to do it. And that works. You know, so it, it works. I put a couple of beehives in my backyard. Yeah. And now I have a lot of clover. Really? You think it's because of the bees? This is so clover is is a hardy plant right like most fields if you go out and you were to, to mow down the grasses and see what ends up coming up first you you have a good chance of seeing a lot of clover coming through there you pretty know? dominant yeah it, it it really depends on um you know what else it's competing with you know and, and if it's something that's that's grown tall already and it's not getting the light you're not going to have a chance at, at it growing you know well it's in my yard i just wondered if the the bees were german i'm sure they're probably helping oh, a little sure. more yeah well yeah. you know what helps you is the deer you know going to the bathroom there <laughs> if they're eating that and moving it around i've seen it it it'll it'll just keep growing and it's manure in there and it just there you go hold the edges of mine and i spray it too though i spray it with the stuff they recommend just to to kill the weeds help it out and uh, i frost seed it because they say every five years you should redo it uh the one up here heck i'm going on seven eight years just keep frosting just keep frosting it and because you go up there now and you'll see you know the pockets that open up over time uh -huh. just bare ground so i just i'm i frost seed and i always thought i'm like that's the biggest waste of money that's just another gimmick to sell <laughs> clover and then i'm like you know what i'm gonna try it and the next year, then it took back off. I was like, oh, that saved me a ton of money then, killing it, redoing it. It's already a yeah. nice, pretty yeah. green plot. Yeah. Well, and it, you know, then that'll choke the weeds out because the weeds would have grown where there was no growth. Right. Well, so that, what's the best way to keep these undergrowth weeds out of them? I spray them. I, I'm, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm the herbicide guy to hell with it. I'm going to spray them. It just, I look at it, it as I got too much money in it to you know, I see do results. it once a year. And I only do it once a year. I don't. I don't do it multiple times. I well, usually, most soybean usually. farmers spray theirs, don't they? That's I, why the clean soybeans that yeah. without the weeds are sprayed. Well, I spray. I definitely spray with Roundup or whatever glycosol, whatever you want to call it. Kill the bees. I kill. <laughs> I do because I spray it on the on the soybeans or corn. If you don't, it'll choke them out one thousand percent. The weeds. Because I didn't one year on the uh, on the clover or on the corn because my sprayer broke i couldn't get parts and i was like well i'm not gonna go buy a new one until the parts come in and by that time it was too tall i would have just smashed it by by running it over you know because it was already too high and by the time it got it was it choked it all out so i was like well that solves my problem of should i spray them or should i not you know it, it already definitely spray. It, it said spray yeah. So, yeah i mean your your only other option is um mowing if you have taller just raising your deck up, try to try to knock down the weeds that are that are out competing the clover. Um, a lot of organic ways to go about all that. Um, it is more time consuming than just spraying it. Which again, when we get back to the heart of this topic, it is how much time do you have? Right. right? You know. So, um, a lot of ways to to skin that cat, so to speak. Um, you know, well, I just know that I spent a ton of time tilling up these fields and spraying originally and then planting all this stuff for it to not grow. Yeah. Did you test the soil? No. That's the number one first thing. Number one first Number thing. one. Don't you even just, waste your money. You wasted money on all that seed and all your time. And like any of us, you know, time's more valuable than almost at this point, you know, the money. I mean, my biggest thing, my father will tell you, pull out a tape measure. See where your age falls on that thing. Now, you got more time at the beginning of it, <laughs> towards the end of it, or not. So, you know, to me, time becomes, you know, more valuable, valuable. Because let's just do it right the first time so we don't have to keep doing it again like I used to. Yep. And, and that's the thing. I mean, when I used to coach, 
lucky this this dumb dumb over here took and goes <laughs> and see room time zero time i was doing his and his brothers i i don't even know honestly i don't know how i got it done and cut the grass of 100 acres because i cut it all I'm, i can't help it i can't have it grow up the deer have the best walking lanes <laughs> in the in the county by far because i just can't i can't take it i can't leave it it just bothers me so i i cut everything down but i got a 15 foot bat wing finishing mower so it helps it goes Makes faster it, quicker, yeah. it goes a little f- quicker than it used to take me two full days back the bat wing then. goes with the batman on the <laughs> on the gate or sure Straight, just take a picture of it you can put that on there yeah i got a picture <laughs> of it. i'm sure yes yeah, so, yeah take a picture of it beforehand but uh had to keep everybody else out. You know, everybody wants to get in here. You start. Well, what's up Killing with the air. what's up with the Batman and the Superman thing? Well, and now I understand why your kid's named Bane. I'm Bane and Lex. Well, because Lex yeah, Luthor. <laughs> Got you. I was a big Superman fan, and uh, I wanted to call him Alexander. My wife hated it, and uh, her her grandmother was like, "Well, we're just gonna call him Lex for short. Just name him Lex." We're like, "Yeah, good, good thinking." So then, all my ground and stuff uh, that I keep. I keep in one of my LLCs, which is uh, two call McVillains. Is that what's your hat? So that's my hat. So that that's my that's my ground that I buy that I keep uh, is two call McVillains, and then the other stuff that I I don't keep or uh, that I'm more investment is, uh, you know, in in the movies it's LexCorp. Well, LexCorp was taken, so it's in, and we got two call McVillains. So we uh, I went with Bain Corp. That's cool. So, so yeah. when I'm when I'm dead and gone, they've they've got their own LLCs with ground in it. And, nice. Uh, Good job. Yeah, this one they'll they'll have a lot of problems selling this one now. So <laughs> we got this one wrapped up pretty good. So good luck selling that one. Boys. I gotta ask, how many points is on the deer he killed? Oh yeah, so that that was Lex's deer there. That one's how many's on there, buddy? What we say, twenty one? Yeah, the one you killed. Twenty one. Twenty one points. points. Yeah, and then the one beside it with the both of those are yours. Yep. Nice. nice. So back to back, yeah. So so, the so there you move. yeah. So there you go. Ten and eleven, killing <laughs> seventeen and killing shit twenty-one like points. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. shit like that. So there you go. You know. Yeah, his first buck. What that was your biggest one at uh, with the thing behind it there. What was that? Seven years old. Yeah. So that was his first first big buck there. He shot a basket one, the kind of first year, but he shot that with a crossbow, and uh, he was actually in the Whitetail Institute magazine. Oh, that's cool. Uh, I sat it in there, and uh, I still got the picture. You can't wipe the smile off his face oh, with that. that. So he's a good shot. Now I was just irritated because I looked at. It, I'm like, Jesus, I was 20 some years old for sure. I want that big. Yeah, <laughs> to mid 30s. What the dude? Sex. <laughs> the hell. <laughs> I should have shot that one, but you know, again, it comes down to. Uh, and I know Scott's the same, and I know you guys are. It, it's more enjoyment to sit there with your kids. Oh, absolutely. Than it is. Those are the hunts that mean the most. Oh, yeah. It's a world. Yeah. It, that's, and that's why we do it. I mean, let's be honest. I mean, I enjoy it. Don't get me wrong. I, I enjoy it, but I enjoy it because of that reason of it. You know, it'll be, uh, they always say, you know, you, you we have all this time and we follow our kids around baseball, basketball, whatever. But what happens when that stops? Like you said, like, f- what do we do then? That's right. Well, I've got a nine-year-old, a four-year-old, and a two-year-old. And so, like, I, I just you're like, just getting started, man. You're just getting started. Yeah, but I can see like how fast she got to nine. Oh, uh, and, blink of an eye, isn't it? And, yeah, yeah. Blink before long, we're quick. Yeah, she's halfway to the point of being eighteen. You know, you were four running around with me. And yeah, now, now I'm about to be. Now I'm thirty-four. <laughs> it's amazing. Don't. I mean, Scott won't tell you. Women. <laughs> if, uh, yeah, which is crazy because he went to just the school down the road, and uh, I knew of him. And then once we, you know, got back around because he wrestled, I I did basketball, so we weren't in the same sports loop. But you know, we're small town, you know, you, you know each other. But then once we kind of got back together with this, and uh, you know, it's been pretty cool. Where friendships really taking off. And that's great. We enjoy yeah. the same stuff. And yeah, deer hunting will bring you together. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So, which counties are you? close to like that you service around here um so belmont county jefferson harrison uh monroe some noble i don't know if we really get into guernsey county a whole lot but well with most of the stuff that they do like the the, the back the mix that i get the what you call it, kryptonite for the food for plot. the food they're, yeah the food plots kryptonite we do we don't have a real name for they just have my name on it, my last name but yeah the 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 
you can go and how I used to do it. Though it'll be on a pallet, saran wrapped, and you just pull up whether you want one thing of it or, or two or whatever. You have to buy it by the ton because yeah. of how they mix it. But anybody can come and get that in mm-hmm. where you live. You know, yeah. if you want to drive and get it in. I, and we'll deliver it too. Yeah, there's a delivery. Just a delivery. Right. Yeah. That's just the feed by the ton. Yeah. 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 So you don't it. have to buy it in the in the truck, is what I was getting at. Yeah. Like, what if I wanted bag. the kryptonite? You can get that by the bag. Yep. Yeah. Fifty pound bag in it. Yep. So and that's that's you know we messed with that with the uh, what was that the turnips. Radish, so we had what all's in it. We had turnips, radish, some peas, um, and then I think some oats in it. As well as some winter oats, forage oats. What's fifty pound bag cost? I mean, it changes with market prices. Um, I don't even know off the top of my head. I don't remember where it right on it. Um, I don't. I've learned not to ask prices. So that <laughs> when my wife asked me, I can literally. I don't. I have no idea. I mean, 50, he'll send me a bill. A fifty pound bag of plant. How big a? So it depends on what all is in the in the mix. Like yeah. the kryptonite. So the kryptonite fifty pound bag. What is? Because of the pea, so a pea is a good little, size. It's that's a large big, seed, yeah. so I, I think we were putting down like one twenty to the acre yeah. for um, for that one. One hundred and twenty pounds. Yeah, but now if you get into clovers, you're looking it's at like like sand. Yeah, you're looking yeah. at like fifteen pounds for an acre yeah. per acre. So it it all varies, and you know that's the stuff to the, that you know I calculate out what are, yeah. what are we going to need to be able to get this to grow. Um, and what percentages of each type of seed should be in there so they're not out competing each other. Um, I, I'm not sure. The, the peas didn't do a great job this year, um, which which they should have. We based it off of uh, uh, of a different different mix, and, you know, I looked and found the, the winter peas that should have worked for the time of the year. They didn't take off. Um, again, again, there's so many variables. Um, if you broadcast the pea, did it really get down into the soil where right. it needs to to grow? Did the birds eat? Yeah. yeah. And that's what I told him. I didn't, I broadcasted it because I don't have a, a row and because I looked at buying them. That was ridiculous, by the way. Um, so I just broadcasted it and I rolled it where I think I should have drug it. Yeah. I think that would have been the ticket if I drug it. But on the other hand, though, the other stuff did take off. Yeah. The turnips, yeah. beets, the brassicas yeah, all, they, all took off like crazy. And it, they, hammered the lead and that was the thing though that i look at too so it's a, it's a two-parter to me i'm always looking at that for the money it's two-parter so since my soybeans and it which when we had that drought of like three weeks i planted my soybeans like uh, two weeks before that because we did have rain and it did rain and they did come up but then no rain just and then the deer wiped them out which was still good because it's protein in the stems all the stuff so i tilted back up and we put the kryptonite on it and the leaves, you know, and the cool thing was they didn't eat them right away. They let them get big, and then they devoured them. I mean, it, it looked like a bunch of lettuce out there, right? Yeah, it, it was awesome. I mean, that's literally what it looked like. And then literally a month later, it was all gone, which, again, some people are like, oh, man, I was no, you want that because now they're eating that. Like, right. they're healthy now. Mm-hmm. They're eating, and then they're staying here. Right. They're staying on my ground. And that was it. And then once we got the first couple cold, then they actually start eating the radish, the turnip and stuff. So it, it, and I sent you that picture. I mean, there was 20 deer in that field and that was probably maybe two acres of it I had there. Yeah. And, and I mean, there was 20 deer in it and they weren't, you know, they were, I mean, the other stuff was corn and clover, but they were in that all eating the leaves and then the turnips and everything. So again, we're just trying to figure it out for everybody. So it makes it a lot easier. So, sure. so when you're not doing it, okay, I got a couple steps. Check the soil, then go to the feed mill, see what, how much I need for that. And then the biggest thing, like we said, the fertilizer, and then you're not wasting money. And I look back now and after we talk about how much money I wasted. Oh, yeah. I mean, just trying to figure, trying to get it to grow. It just doesn't make sense. Well, and it's, uh, you know, I was at a, a conference today up in Amish country uh, for grass seed and it doesn't matter what you're planting like soil sample yeah first soil sample first that that is number one first rule you know and, and from a, a deer hunter's perspective you know we haven't planted a lot of stuff right no, like we're grab a bag of stuff okay i need oh, a bag yeah. i'm gonna throw it out some of this oh, some of that for the best right um it, we haven't gone through the proper steps of okay. I need to know what the soil's doing before I start throwing anything at it. You know, so it's uh, 
it, it's preached at, at every grassy event I go to. Um, you know that, and then the other the other important thing is time of the year that you plant. Um, they they always say plant on date and not the weather. Um, you know, like the past couple of weeks have been super warm, right? So you're like, oh, I need to get out there and plant something. Well, it's it's way too early to actually plant. Now that's different than frost seeding, right? And, and things like that. Um, but plant based on the the suggested planting dates of those types of seeds because that's known to give it the best rate of success. Well, that's funny you say that because I always then plant my corn later. I don't want it to come in in August, late July. I want it to come September. So your October. corn matures by a certain amount of days in the ground. Yep. Correct. So the soybean goes by hours of sunlight in the day. Yes. So when you plant soybeans late, they plant it early. at the same time. Well, soybeans you want to get in as as soon as you can because you want it to sprout. You want the deer to start eating it because it is packed full of protein. So you want them to eat that first. So if you don't have any late season, and that's what we've talked about, I don't care. Because then I'll till that back up and plant kryptonite. Put something else. Yeah. There. So then I know they they eat all that protein. And then again, I don't feed the then my my you know, my protein now only lasts in that seven hundred and fifty pound feeder for about five days. But then once everything else starts going, it'll last two weeks. So to me, okay, that's my trade off now. Mm -hmm. They're eating all that protein perfect they have supplemental they know it's here and then i'll till that up put the other stuff but the corn i want to plant later because i don't want it to you know to mature at that point because i'm not touching it and the deer aren't going in there at at that point either you know they don't mess with it until i mean they'll go in there a little bit but once i cut it down until then that it's usually, on usually until the acorns are gone yeah so then that's i've learned that that i usually don't plant the corn till uh labor day for uh, Memorial Day, after Memorial Day, I'll plant corn. So then it's, you know, everybody says, oh, knee high by the 4th of July. Now, nah, mine's mid shit. going to harvest it yeah. sell. Yeah. Mine's mid shit. Mid shit about that yeah. time. So I uh, I plant that later. But corn, you know, soybean, as soon as I get it, it's going in the ground. As soon as I can physically, uh, and I till every like year. May 10th? I, again, it just goes on as quick as. Is that when you can recommend be. around May 10th or May 15th? I'm not a big soybean guy, so I, I don't really know the the date on that one without looking it up. But. Well, except my biggest problem is just getting in the field. You know, I have to till it up, and by the time I till it up, like when it's not muddy, yeah, yeah like yeah. I can, you can't even if I had the the right cedar for it instead of basically, uh, you know, and I, and it's a row planter. Don't get me wrong, but until I can get it to should not bind up and be you know it has to be somewhat solid yeah so that all just depends on on weather weather yeah so i can't i can't mess with it after that but but you know like i said we've we've been trying we've been it's working yeah we're killed trying. some nice deer here we're trying having a lot of fun doing it yeah yeah. Well, that's the main thing you know as long as the kids enjoy it and uh the wife and we have fun with it you know unfortunately technology's gotten better so it makes it easier to kill them you know I've, oh yeah I've, I've just had to call you for advice should i let it go should you you know come in what do you think you know instead of uh you know we know it's dead and and i like to be part of every every recovery so call me anytime oh that's all i'm you know we still we still text and stuff oh, yeah. you know we're not tracking oh, yeah. on, so it is true what you say about making friends always so now we always uh so always appreciate you guys so real quick What's the uh, track look like for you guys? Like, so I I've never seen it happen. Oh, so, right. so yeah. So what's that. what's that what's that process look like? I I shot a deer yesterday. I let it lay all night. Um, so I normally can't find you'll, it. you'll call me and I'll ask a series of questions like, how long ago did you shoot it? Because we want to give it plenty of time to die. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have an idea where you hit it? Because that that again leads to how long to wait before you go look at look. You don't want to jump it. And then uh, normally it's you'll you'll track the blood until you can't follow no more blood, and I usually don't matter if um, if you go out another hundred yards or so and look beyond the, your last blood just to make sure it's not there. But if you can't find the deer, then I'll ask you just don't grid search. Uh, the more you grid search, you're walking down the trail, you're getting the blood on your shoes, you're just spreading scent everywhere. So the more time you spend in there, the more scent you put in the area. You're spreading around. Okay. So it's like 
if 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 the if the, if you had, didn't go in there and the dog was to go down the blood trail on his own, it'd be like him reading a comic book. But after you grid search, it's like him having to read a novel. There's just that much more information he has to interpret, so it takes him a lot longer. Okay. So we'll go down the trail, and uh, you, usually there'll be no more blood for you to follow. So you'll call me, and I'll bring the dog, and we'll start down the trail. Usually I'll start right where he shot the deer. And uh, as we go along, he normally will will stop and smell the ground where there's blood. And if I, if it's a visible sign that we can see, I'll normally tell you there's sign here. And I'll have you stay behind me. And uh, if we find blood, I'll keep bringing you up to last blood. I normally have you stand on last blood. That gives me a good visual to look back on. And I'm also marking it on my phone so I know right where the last blood is. And uh, we'll go to a certain distance, say, if it's shot in the lungs, heart, lung cavity in front of the diaphragm, you only have three things up there to kill it, the heart, lungs, and main arteries. And any of those three, if it's fatal, it's normally 300 yards or less. And normally, you don't need me for those type deer. There's normally so much sign that you, you'll you find You're going to find it. Yeah. So if we think it's shot up front, you find the lung blood, there's no sign of gut matter on the air, there's no sign of corn in the blood, we think it's in front of the diaphragm if we start making it three four or five hundred yards we're still finding blood no beds no dead deer we're not seeing the failing deer we'll probably call it as a survivor but now when we find gut matter on your era the era stinks there's corn in the blood uh most of the time we'll take that deer just because that that deer's fatal yeah it's, it's going to die Usually within 600 yards. And normally bedded within 600 yards. So as long as you're not bumping it and pushing it around all over the place. I mean, yeah, but if it's gut shot deer and it's, you know. If it's gut shot and you bump it, just back out. Just leave, give it several more hours, even overnight. Yeah. Then go back and look. If it's lung shot deer and you see them foamy clusters of lung blood, if you wait a couple hours and you go in there and you jump it, uh, you better keep pushing it push it as hard as you can because the way they die of a lung shot is they drowned um if you shoot them in the heart uh, the heart fails it fails to pump blood if you hit the main arteries to where it's a fatal artery shot the arteries fail they continue they quit uh, pumping blood to the proper areas but the lungs is more like a bunch of little balloons clustered together you picture it as one big balloon so you pop it it, it no longer holds air it's more like a millions of little balloons and you pop some of them and uh when the air goes through there it pops some of the little balloons but all the rest of them keep working and can the way it dies is it drowns uh blood rushes in faster than it can get the blood out and it actually drowns okay so if it's lung shot and you go over three or four hundred yards it's going to use normally be a survivor if it's if there's gut matter We'll normally take it uh, until we find it. Most yeah, time, if it's gut it. hit, it's it's dead it's deer. Yeah. Now they can live. Then you may not know this, but they can live being shot in the lungs, like and recovered, and, and they can recover from it. Really? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. That's we, amazing. We, that was that was Allie's deer to the. I think I that's what happened. To that. I think that's what happened to one I shot. It just didn't bleed. <laughs> it's very possible. Yeah. the The other thing, the other thing that you probably didn't know is they don't track the blood. The deer have a gland between their hooves called an interdigital gland, and that's what they that's what they track. Gotcha. Cause, so that's like what the deer are when they're stomping, right? Like they're putting that scent. They are. Yeah. They're actually, that gland is a, you know, that gland is there to prevent bacterial infections, but it's also a scent communicator in the herd. Tells them how what where his testosterone levels are at, okay. uh, which deer it is, and that's how the dog can decipher all the deer tracks out there versus the wounded deer. When they're they're wounded, putting out a difference, the different scent. Okay. There's a huge pheromone burst right when you wound, when you hit one, and there's a huge scent dump right at that spot, and that scent is different than from all the other deer. It's unique to that deer, like fingerprints to a people. Okay, and that's what that's how that dog is able to key in on that one track. A lot of times it'll be two days later, and it'll be on a corn pile or a food plot, and there'll be twenty deer, like you said. There'll be a bunch of deer walk right over that same track, and he's still able to find that track because that one deer 
is leaving a different wounded scent than all the rest. I got to. Which is also a way that we can usually tell if the deer is going to be dead or not by the way the dog acts and the way the dog tracks it. If, if, if the deer is hurt really bad, he's pumping out a lot of scent and the dog's really into it. If he's not mortally wounded, then the dog just doesn't have any interest in it. Okay. Well, I remember when, we, when uh, my wife's lived, Allie's lived, that big one, uh, the dog was, he was all right going down because it was the next, this was maybe the next day or day it after. It was the next day. And we, and we tracked it a good way because we had good blood, but then it just kind of died up, but then he went downhill. And, you know, the dog was, he was all right. And then once he got on the other side of the hill, he was on. Yeah. And that's where we jumped him and, and she hit it in the lung and it went through and, and, uh, we tried a couple times this year, at least three or four times. Actually, it's more than that. We had probably six, seven sits trying to get it, uh, trying to get him. But you get them old deer that were wounded. They ain't, they ain't stupid. Yeah, they come in. You know, and and where we're hunting there, it's not. It's thirty by by seventy, so it's not big a hilltop. It's not big at all. So he knew, you know, he was, you know, learning him, and he learned us. But you know, and we always knew it was him because. His rack looked the same, but it was all, I mean, it was all messed up. It was nowhere near where he was, but his, uh, was it left leg or right leg? One of them was, was pinned DMP. up. Yeah, it was pinned up. So we knew it was him. So then, but you could see where she hit him. I mean, it looked like a 10 ring shot. Yeah. Those but, 10 ring shots, you just, a lot of times don't kill them. <laughs> no, it was amazing. Like, I was just like, I could not believe it. Cause she's a good shot. Like, I mean, I, I, you know, I try not to make her mad. So, I mean, <laughs> Hey, you know, it's, if you get time, go on Facebook and go to, uh, actually, I think it's on their YouTube, um, might be on their Facebook too, Raised Hunting. Okay. Um, they shot a deer through, they had it on video, shot it through shoulders, like double lunged it, and then it lived, and the neighbor guy killed it, well, I don't know, a month later. It was full of infection. The deer's all like swelled up and stuff, and like the neighbor's like, you can see it's like tingling it, but the deer lived. That's we, crazy. We tracked a piebald deer. And uh, the guy had shot it, liver shot it, so there wasn't a lot of blood, and it was a fixed blade, so he just didn't have much of a trail. But we found it, and we were standing there while they gutted it. Well, when he gutted it, there was six inches of air and a muzzy broadhead in one of the lungs, and the one lung was completely deflated. Well, it was a nice eight-point pie bulb, and it had been shot by another hunter, an out-of-state, out-of-town hunter that was farms over like a mile and a half away, two weeks prior so it lived for two weeks with six inches of air and a muzzy rotted in yeah, the one slow. lung wow and it came into a feeder just like it was fine it didn't show any sign of dying yeah well that's what when when we finally got it back on camera it was it was early january and she shot it early i mean it was it was october and it caught like because we had you down there and then we grid searched after you were there because i'm like it has to be dead but it was going towards the neighbor so we didn't want to mess him up and uh but we grid searched that and he finally showed back up yeah because i was like that got to be him look at the size of his pedicles survivor and then yeah i mean it, w- it was him because then he he stayed all winter because then i fed him so he stayed all winter so uh my camera i haven't I haven't been back down there because it's uh once it gets muddy down there i can't get on top of that hilltop and i ain't carrying that my buckets up there <laughs> so if i can't get up there i ain't going um but he he was there all so I, I venture to say he's still there, but my, my batteries are dead and stuff. So I was just like, "Ah, go get back down there." But it was it was amazing to me though. He was that gimpy, and he just went away for a little bit. But he was like, "You know what? You got the best food around." So we'll he's back. back. And they almost always show back up. Yeah, amazing. Because you told me that you're like, "Well, if he lives, he'll be back." Yeah, he was. Back. He was. It was nuts. Well, um, everybody, think about going to your local co-op, talking to them they can mix up stuff for you or if you're in this area come see him um, belmont mills belmont mills and uh other than that chris thanks for having us um it's been great a great time you. heck yeah we appreciate, appreciate and, you uh, thinking nice to meet you scott yeah yeah it's nice to meet you it's been a good time i've always wanted to do do podcasts okay. yeah we'll so do it again this is my start yeah. <laughs> you, you almost saw him you know a month or two ago so uh, that was the next day <laughs> i said well let me come out and lex come out and Oh, maybe you get that say blood, action. buddy. I don't, I, don't, I, don't think you, I don't think you hit him. I don't see any blood through here, man. You, there's going to be something, I promise. Yeah, well, hopefully you don't need us, but if you do, yeah, we'll yeah, come. Yeah, That's really sure. come. Now, it, it's it's neat, and everybody, like I said, you, you've been with my buddy Eric, uh, I think my buddy Chuck, uh, several guys up here, you know, and, and that's what makes it nice that 
you know, I, I'm one of those guys, I don't like to give out a number if nobody, you know, they're not going to help you out. Sure. So when you talk to me about this co or about the podcast, I'm like, oh, I got to get Scott because of what we're doing here. I don't think anybody knows. Well, it's very informative, you know, like so many people do what I did this year and just walked into tractor supply and spend four times the money on something that's not, not going to grow enough and not going to grow and didn't, didn't do a dirt sample. And, you know, I got time taking a tractor out there and tiller and planting and Wasted, seed man. and, you know, all those hours and, yeah, it was well, pretty much wasted. It, and you look at it, and you, you do that once, and you're like, "Well, I'm not doing that again, right?" Like right. That, that was that was pointless. Yeah. You know, um, so so that's part of the process too. Yeah. You know? Well, then it's not fun. Yeah. You know, that's my thing. It's not fun. Then I'm mad because it didn't work, and then I sure is nice when it does work. Well, yeah, that's it. I mean, yeah. I, I just I, I was I was tickled to death, and when you called me, Justin, I was like. Man, you ain't gonna believe this. I, I killed freaking four deer. You know, one high one seventies, another in the one sixties, one up there one forty, and then his goofy thing, all within t- the two to three hundred yards of each other. Yeah, which to me was in, was insane. You know, and really, you know, the last two years is where we've really been hitting it hard with the mineral and stuff. So I can't wait to see. I mean, you see the one big shed there of that eight pointer that I know that deer's only four years old. So what does oh, next yeah. year look like? They should blow up next oh, year. Oh, and he is a staple at the feeder right now. I mean, he's an absolute. And you know it's him because he's twice the size of everybody else. Yeah. I mean, he's literally just going to be enormous. It'll be. Well, let us know if you figure anything out with Warren. Yeah. 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 I mean, he uh, never thought about that. I'm glad yeah. you guys brought that up. That was yeah. something. And the flies. Uh, my deer are covered with flies about that would be about the, the end of August, that would be September the right the there. They're covered with flies. Yeah. I wouldn't know what to do but boy if you did something i'd like to know yeah no i'll uh i'll, I'll take a look at it. i don't know if it bothers them you know they've, they've lived through it this long but <laughs> it bothers me to see it all i mean don't even think about that but look at you know my buddy eric that does the, the taxidermy the amount of ticks that come off this the amount of owl, ticks, so you know so you know that's gonna kill them off you know or or you know help their immune system with that so now again look what we're doing again we're putting all the energy into the antlers that's right so yep Hey, we appreciate it, man. Yeah, man. Thank you, me. I appreciate it. We'll do another one for sure. We'll see what we can come up with this year when we're shooting stuff. So, (laughs) good. We'll see what happens with us. All right, guys. Well, everybody, have a great night. Thanks for having us. Yep. Thanks, Thanks, guys. guys. Thanks. See you.